What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to, what if Hashirama had a grandson with wood release? Finale. Like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. These three days passed by in the blink of an eye. The third Hokage stood, along with numerous shinobi from different clans. Their numbers peaked near at a thousand, yet they were facing tens of thousands of shinobi. Some of them couldn't help but gulp down a mouthful of saliva. This was the time, the time which would decide the fate of Kanoha's future. They could see their enemies, the Suna shinobi with the third Kazakage leading them. And there was another person a bit behind the third Kazakage. Upon his appearance, the third Hokage hatefully gritted his teeth. He immediately understood why he didn't receive any news about this invasion from Sunagakure. His spies had been replaced with fake ones. He never expected for Orochimaru to be in Sunagakure, and the fact that Orochimaru had replaced the Hokage spies with his own. Now, the odds were stacked against himself. Facing the third Kazakage and Orochimaru at the same time though, he felt like bitterly laughing. But soon, that expression started burning with fierce determination. Since it had all come to this, the Hokage didn't plan to be lenient. He immediately summoned the Monkey King, Enma, and instructed him to turn into a staff. Enma noticed the huge number of shinobi appeared in front of them and didn't ask any question. He turned into a huge staff and was held by the third Hokage. Sanagakure shinobi were soon quite close to the third Hokage and others' location. The third Kazakage stared at the third Hokage while commenting, You look in so much pain, Hokage. I think I should help you and relieve you of this pain. The third Hokage ignored him and stared at Orochimaru. You really did betray Kanoha. You should know full well of the consequences of this action. I won't be holding back. Orochimaru. He said the word, Orochimaru, with a tinge of malice in his voice. Orochimaru though didn't appear to be intimidated. How cruel of you, Sensei. I am, after all, your brightest student. I am forced to do this, as well. If I didn't do this, I would have died a few years later. This is the best method of preserving my life. Heh. <laughs> you are quite right about that, Orochimaru. At that moment, they all heard an amused voice. This voice made Orochimaru shudder uncontrollably. He, along with all the other shinobi present, turned to stare at the voice. There, he saw a rocky seated on the branch of a tree. He had quite the casual look on his face, as if he couldn't care less about this war. Es senju a rocky, Orochimaru called out, a bit fearfully. His main motive was to let the third Kazakage know that this was senju a rocky, the man who couldn't be taken lightly, his skill at wood style was so great that he could practically be called a second Senju Hashirama. Don't worry Orochimaru, you didn't disappoint me. I knew letting you live would be the correct decision. I did want either Suna or Kiri to attack Kanoha. It seems you convinced Suna. Araki gave out an explanation, not because he was kind, just because he was interested in what kind of expression Orochimaru would have. And truly, Orochimaru didn't disappoint him. The utter shock, the dumb confusion, it was just pleasant to see. Well, fortunately for Suna, I don't have anything against them. So, I won't be killing any Suna shinobi, but there is someone who needs to die first. Araki turned towards the third Hokage and said, Haven't you waited a long time? The time has come, old man. Send you Araki. There is a time and a place for everything. You can deal with our personal grudges later. The third Hokage said while staring at Araki. Nah, I want to deal with our grudges now. Araki said, showing a hint of stubbornness while staring at the Hokage. At this moment, the Hyuga clan head stared at Araki while activating his Byakugan. Don't you understand? You are putting the entire Kanoha at risk. The Senju clan will be branded as a traitor. 
Araki simply shrugged in response. Oh really? I wanna see just what you can do to me. So what I am a traitor? Do you think I really care? At least I am not shameless enough to not admit it. Right Orochimaru and Monkey. His words were spoken with hatred mixed in it. Meanwhile, the third Kazakage was completely confused about this entire scene. He was so confused that he didn't even ask his shinobi to charge forward and kill the Kanoha shinobi. He never expected the Hokage to have internal strife with the Senju clan head, Senju Araki. Orochimaru never mentioned anything about this. Meanwhile, Orochimaru felt like he had been played. It was as if Senju Araki was waiting for him here. Uchiha Kashiro stepped forward. A few more Uchiha clan members following his lead. I am Uchiha Kashiro, the clan head of the Uchiha clan. As long as I am standing, not a single one of the Sunagakure shinobi will step inside Kanoha. This, I swear at this moment. His crimson eyes stared at the third Kazakage who frowned upon hearing Kashiro's words. He noticed the three Tomo into those eyes revolving and changing into a pentablated pattern. I won't be holding back at all, Kazakage. Tsukuyami. Quite a surprising pattern indeed. And before the third Kazakage even understood anything, he found himself in an unfamiliar location. The world of Tsukuyami, merely a second had passed, and the third Kazakage fell on the ground with a blank look on his face. The Sanagakure shinobi were shocked to see their Kage collapsing so suddenly. At that moment, an elderly woman named Chio shouted out, Don't look into his eyes. That's a Sharingan. Kazakage-sama had been struck by an unknown jutsu and lost his consciousness. Kashiro thought, I only tortured him for 24 hours. That should be enough for him to stay out cold. Now that the Suna shinobi will try to divide their focus and protect their Kage, I have successfully managed to sow seeds of discord in their chain of command. Achiha clan. Charge. He shouted the word charge and just like that, the Uchiha clan rushed at the Sunagakure shinobi. The other clan members also didn't want to be left behind. They also ordered their respective shinobi to charge. The one fighting against Orochimaru was Kashiro. Orochimaru was rather careful in not falling in his Jinjutsu. He was dodging the attacks while keeping track of Kashiro's movements. At some point, Kashiro used Amaterasu against Orochimaru. However, Unlike what he expected, Orochimaru seemed to have shed his skin and escaped Amaterasu. This was beyond disgusting and he sure as hell wanted to delete that from his mind. Unfortunately, once record by Sharingan, Kashiro couldn't forget this scene even if he wanted to. A few puppeteers were the ones keeping the life of their Kage safe. Chio was even injecting him with some sort of drug. She could only hope that it worked. Meanwhile, Araki jumped down from the tree while staring at the third Hokage. Let's start as well, shall we? The third Hokage's complexion was quite ugly as he stared at Araki. Perhaps he had a faint idea that he might lose this battle. Meanwhile, a sword appeared in Araki's hand. The sword was quite long, nearly a meter of so long, and quite thin in terms of breadth. Its sharp side was reflecting the sun's faint rays. I never thought you would choose such a time to fight me. You should know that with these actions, you are literally destroying Kanoha yourself. The Hokage said while staring at Araki. I am simply returning the favor, monkey. Don't act as if you didn't play a hand in Yuzushio's destruction. I wanted your death, but I wanted your death at such an occasion where you would feel the greatest regret and pain. Araki said with a cold smile on his face. Without hesitating any further, he rushed at the third Hokage with his top speed. To this, the third Hokage sneered in his heart and thought, rushing towards your enemy without even observing him first. You really are a kid, Senju Araki. Their weapons clashed against each other and produced a huge shockwave. Even the shinobis of Sunagakure and Kanahagakure were shocked and unconsciously turned their eyes to Araki and the Hokage's fight. Araki was the one on the offensive as he kept on attacking the third Hokage with his quick strikes, while the third Hokage was hard-pressed to defend them all. The main reason why Araki was on the offensive was that his weapon was lighter than Hokage's weapon, and it could be used for quick successive strikes. However, this wasn't the main reason why Hokage was on the defensive. He was waiting, waiting for an opportunity. 
and his eyes flashed with a strange glint when he found it. At that moment, he swung the great adamantine staff with his entire strength and hit Araki. Araki was a little surprised by the sudden strength. He was flung away. Araki crashed into some trees in that side, and his eyes widened slightly when he saw the Hokage going through hand seals. He was well aware of what the Jutsu would be. Fire style, Dragon Flame Bomb. The third Hokage let out a breath of fire which transformed into Fire Dragon and hits Araki's body. The flames were so massive that even the Tsuna Shinobi broke out a sweat. This man was truly dangerous. Without their Kazakage to protect them from these flames, they didn't feel assured about their chances of surviving it. The third Hokage seemed to have let out a breath of relief after having used this Jutsu. Just when he turned his head towards the Tsuna Shinobi, he heard another voice from his right side. Hmm, you really burnt my wood clone to a crisp. I guess I was underestimating you a bit too much. Hearing this voice, the third Hokage had an urge to slap himself. Just how could he think that this would be over so quickly? He turned towards the direction and saw a rocky seated on a tree, quite similar to how he had been seated on the tree when he declared his presence here. The third Hokage didn't hesitate and charged at him with his top speed. In turn, Araki said, Let me return the favor from earlier. Water style, Water Dragon Jutsu. A huge water dragon was made out of the air, and it rushed towards the third Hokage with a quick speed. The third Hokage immediately stopped before using Earth Style Mud Wall Jutsu. With this, he somehow managed to protect himself from the water dragon jutsu. Still, he didn't realize that Araki had already closed the distance between them. By the time he noticed Araki, Araki was too close to the third Hokage's position. Before the third Hokage could even raise his staff, his face was punched so strongly that the third Hokage felt his bones shake. In fact, a few cracks might have appeared in his skull. He was thrown back far away. Araki stared at the hand which had punched the third Hokage. Damn, that was a lot more satisfying than I expected. Hey monkey, get up. I won't allow you to go down with just this. Araki was saying it with a crazy smile on his face. This was exactly how he hoped his fight against the third Hokage would be. The third Hokage's hold over Enma. The adamantine staff tightened, but contrary to these actions, he suddenly threw tens of shuriken. He made a hand seal, ninja art, shuriken shadow clone jutsu. These tens of shuriken were multiplied to hundreds of shuriken. Even if Araki wanted to dodge, it would be impossible to dodge this wide-ranged attack. Araki though didn't care about this jutsu. The wind pressure around him changed. Whenever the shuriken was about to touch his body, it would be slightly redirected from its course. Not a single shuriken managed to hit Araki. Naturally, even the Hokage didn't think that these shurikens would hit Araki. He was counting on Araki to use some sort of wall to defend against these shurikens though. If Araki had done that, he could have used that moment to charge and return the favor from earlier. He created three shadow clones and charged at Araki. Araki let out a sigh, wondering just why the Hokage had bothered to create clones. Did he forget that Araki was a sensor? The chakra in the Hokage's real body and his clone was apparent. No matter what he did, he wouldn't be able to fool Araki. Araki let the four of them come and surrounding him. Hokage kept on attacking Araki from four directions, but Araki dodged it rather casually. Suddenly, the Hokage charged forward as he found an opening. And this was exactly what Araki had been waiting for. Just when the third Hokage was about to strike Araki with his staff, a wood clone was created right behind Araki which grabbed the third Hokage by his head. The creation of this wood clone was so sudden that the third Hokage couldn't even defend against it. But his shadow clones didn't stay idle. They immediately went through a couple of hand seals and used respective jutsus. Wind style, Great Breakthrough Jutsu, Earth Style, Earth Dragon Bullet, Lightning Style, Lightning Panther. These three attacks were thrown at Araki and his would clone. They were thrown at them with such precision that these attacks wouldn't hurt the third Hokage's real body. But, just when these three attacks were about to hurt Araki, they heard him speak calmly. Wood Style Tree Wall Barrier, a wall of countless wooden branches was raised. 
All these attacks struck the tree wall but were unable to break past it. Meanwhile, Araki had increased his hold over the third Hokage's head. The bones in his head were breaking apart. Worried about his summoner, the staff held in the third Hokage's hand puffed out and transformed into Monkey King Enma again. Just when the Monkey King was about to strike at Araki's would clone to free the third Hokage, Araki appeared and punched the Monkey King far away. I don't need another monkey here. If you value your life, then return to your realm. And then, Araki turned his head towards the third Hokage whose head hand started bleeding. Blood was running down his nose and currently he was losing the strength to stand erect on his legs. Now then, time to give you a farewell, monkey. Araki said while running at the third Hokage, kicking his head so strongly that it split from the rest of his body. The third Hokage's head went flying in the sky until it landed in the middle of the battlefield between Suna and Kanoha, crushed by the footsteps of hundreds of shinobi. Just as Araki was fighting against the third Hokage, the battle between the Suna Shinobi and Kanoha Shinobi was truly fierce. Kashiro was fighting against Orochimaru, but in the middle of the fight, he would switch his target to other Suna Shinobi and leave a shadow clone to fight against Orochimaru. It wasn't that he was scared of Orochimaru. In reality, he could defeat Orochimaru with his eternal Manjikyu Sharingan quite easily. The thing was, he remembered that Araki had given him a warning to not touch Orochimaru. It was because Araki mentioned that Orochimaru was his prey. He wanted to personally send the snake to the afterlife. That was why, while fighting against Orochimaru, Kashiro kept note of the position of his clan members and was prepared to protect them at any moment. Orochimaru naturally noticed that Uchiha Kashiro wasn't serious while fighting him. He didn't care much of the reason, but all he wanted to do was go to Araki's position and kill him. Araki was fighting against the third Hokage. Orochimaru believed that if he and the third Hokage joined forces, they could kill Araki. However, Achiha Kashiro was blocking his way. Every time he was about to break past him, Kashiro would pull him back as if he was adamant in not making Orochimaru interfere Araki's fight against the Hokage. As the fight was going on between them all, a head flew in their direction. Even from afar, Orochimaru could see that this was Hiruzen's head. He stayed silent for some time as he didn't have much emotional attachment. Still, he couldn't help but feel distressed since he had thought that with Hiruzen, it would have been easier to defeat Araki. All was not lost though, Orochimaru still had his trump card. He used a bit more chakra and used an earth jutsu to go underground and approach Araki. This time, Kashiro didn't stop Orochimaru. It was because Araki had dealt with the third Hokage. Well, not that he had to worry about Araki, but he didn't think it would be a bad idea to assist him. Kashiro looked towards the Suna Shinobi and could finally give them his complete attention. A red-colored skeleton appeared above his body as he stared at his enemies. He coldly spoke the name of this ability, Susanu. With that, he went off to massacre Suna Shinobi. There was not a hint of mercy present in his eyes. Meanwhile, Orochimaru appeared in front of Araki. As he stared at the headless body of Hiruzen, Orochimaru let out a sigh. Perhaps if he had been faster, he could have saved Hiruzen and fought against Araki together. But he knew that there was no use in having regrets at this point. Araki turned towards him, mildly amused that Orochimaru dared to show his face to him here. So what? Have you come here to shorten your life even further? I think you still have like a year or two to live. I cannot allow you to grow any stronger. I have mastered this technique just to kill you, Senju Araki, Orochimaru stated with complete confidence. Araki was a bit surprised to see this. This confidence meant that Orochimaru really had some good trump card under his sleeves. Oh really? Araki seemed to be asking Orochimaru with an indifferent look. Orochimaru raised his hand and made a hand seal, summoning impure world reincarnation. Two coffins appeared in front of him. Araki's eyes widened at these words. He understood just why Orochimaru was so confident about taking him on. He had perfected this jutsu. Heh. So, you knew this jutsu? I can more or less guess the two you have summoned. And that was the last straw, Orochimaru. You do die now. Araki said with a grim look on his face. 
Well, this is also good. Both teach and student dying near the same time. What a great bond you have. Araki said while staring at the coffins. The covers of the coffins fell, and two individuals could be seen there. One with red armor while the other wearing blue armor. Both of them were the late first Hokage, Senju Hashirama, and the second Hokage, Senju Tobarama, respectively. Orochimaru went forward and placed a kunai with a tagged seal on it. Araki naturally saw the seal and smiled mysteriously. Well, well, the situation wasn't as bad as he had thought. Reddish marks appeared on Araki's face as he stared at Orochimaru. If you think you can defeat me by making me fight against my grandfather and my granduncle, then you are dead wrong, Orochimaru. I won't show any mercy to you, regardless of who is protecting you. At that moment, Tobarama opened his mouth and spoke. So, we have been reanimated using my Edo Tensei Jutsu. Huh? Correct, second Hokage. The two of you are going to fight against Senju Araki. He is none other than your grandson, first Hokage. And not just that, he has also inherited your Mokutan. A troublesome opponent indeed, Orochimaru said while staring at Araki. Meanwhile, Hashirama was staring at Araki. He naturally heard of Orochimaru's words and a faint smile appeared on his lips when he saw the markings on Araki's face. The markings of Sage Mode. Tobarama was shocked though. He then stared at Araki and noticed some resemblance between Araki and his elder brother. However, unlike the naive feeling that Hashirama gave out, Araki seemed to be giving out a cold aura. Moreover, with his sensing ability, he could sense that Araki's chakra was huge, even greater than his own during his prime. What is happening over here? He couldn't help but ask the second question. Senju Araki has killed the third Hokage, and he is going to kill me soon. I will be using the two of you to kill him. Tobarama and Hashirama both furrowed their brows in confusion. To hear that their descendant had killed the third Hokage, just what was going on. However, Orochimaru was not in a mood to answer this question, and he said, Now, you will kill Senju Araki. The look in their eyes changed. It was similar to that of a dead look. As if they didn't have their consciousness. Water style, Water Dragon Jutsu. Wood style. Wood Dragon Jutsu. Upon seeing these two attacks, Araki remained on the spot. When the Wood Dragon was close enough, he raised his hand seal and made it collide with the Water Dragon, making it explode and nullify both attacks. Orochimaru, you shouldn't have summoned these two. My mastery over the Wood style is far beyond your understanding. With that, Araki moved forward and went on to punch Hashirama. There was no hesitation in his eyes even though he was up against his grandfather. He knew that his grandfather wasn't in control of his actions, and it would be foolish to remain hesitant in striking the body, which could be considered immortal. As Araki had started fighting against the immortal bodies of his grandfather and granduncle while using his sage mode, Orochimaru was drenched with cold sweat. Currently, he felt as if he was staring at Araki's true power. Even though Hashirama and Tobarama weren't at their true power, with their immortal body and boundless chakra, they could still restrain Araki. Hashirama had also started using his own sage mode while fighting against Araki. The markings on his face were familiar to Araki's markings but darker in comparison. When Araki was hit by their attacks, he felt no intent behind it. It was as if they were simply mindless shinobi at the moment. Initially, other than anger, Araki was even a little excited at the prospect of fighting against his grandfather and granduncle. After all, they were at the very top of the world during their time. But this, this was far too disappointing. He guessed that although the Edo Tensei gave them boundless chakra, it didn't restore their physique. Their bodies were so weak that Araki could crush that body with a single punch. Only his grandfather after using the sage mode could pose some sort of threat to him. Araki even left Tobarama to fight against his wood clone. His sage mode enhanced wood clone should be enough to fight against Tobarama for some time. As Orochimaru witnessed this battle, he couldn't help but back away unconsciously. This was getting far beyond his strength. Although he understood that Araki was strong from the start. He knew this far even four years ago. But to see his strength right now it was just mind-blowing. And not just his strength, 
He also understood that Araki had somehow mastered Sage Mode in this time. It wouldn't be long before Araki could somehow restrain the two of them and attack Orochimaru. Do I need to use my final card that quickly? Orochimaru couldn't help but bit his lips as he didn't want to use his trump card right now. But seeing as there was no choice, he made the hand seals and then spoke. Summoning Impure World Reanimation While Orochimaru had summoned one more person who could fight for him, Kashiro had started fighting against the one-tailed Jinchuriki. Only the one-tailed Jinchuriki, after using the tailed beast mode, managed to restrain his Susanoo to some extent and block its attacks by manipulating sand around them and protecting the other shinobi. The red skeleton Susanoo and started to condense, and nearly half body of the Susanoo was completed. The blade held by this Susanoo was strong enough to restrain the one-tails. At this moment, quite a lot of Konoha shinobi had died at the hands of Suna shinobis and their puppets. The ones with the least casualty were the Uchiha clan. It was mostly because Kashiro had spread his shadow clones and protected them at the crucial moments. But even he couldn't prevent some casualties. At the same time, Araki's eyes widened as he stared at the guy Orochimaru had summoned. Heh, now you have really done it. Araki said while staring at Orochimaru. I have finally been revived. Madara Uchiha spoke with a hint of excitement in his voice. At that moment, Araki decided that it would be foolish to continue the fight against his grandfather and granduncle. Fun time had ended. Two wood clones were created behind Hashirama and Tobarama. They grabbed hold of him rather tightly, and a seal appeared on Araki's hand before he said, Contract seal! He and his wood clone both touched the heads of Hashirama and Tobarama after using this seal. This was a seal which was able to break any contact between the summon and summoner. When Orochimaru was placing his tag between their bodies, Araki had noticed that it was a weak seal and the contract seal could break off Orochimaru's control. The lifeless look in their eyes disappeared, and they could finally think for themselves. You have been playing around with the dead people far too much, Orochimaru, Araki said while staring at Orochimaru with a cold look in his eyes. I do like my life. Without using this jutsu, how would I kill you after all? Orochimaru retorted to Araki's words. Madara then stared at Araki for some time before a smile appeared on his face, as if remembering something. You brat, it seems you have gotten quite big. And what's this? Hashirama and Tobarama? Is this a Senju clan's family reunion? Upon hearing Madara's voice, Hashirama turned his head towards him and said with a low voice, Madara. Meanwhile, Tobarama was completely startled to see Madara reanimated as well. Madara? What's going on? Tobarama spoke out, quite surprised at this all situation. The last thing he remembered was hearing that he and his elder brother were going to fight against their descendant. And now that the control over their minds had been broken, he was looking at Madara. Tobarama? Upon looking at Tobarama, Madara released a low growl. It wouldn't be wrong to say that he hated Tobarama the most since Tobarama was the one who killed his little brother, Izuna. Well, it's rather a strange situation, and I don't think I have the luxury to explain it to you right now, grandfather, granduncle. We can talk about it later. Araki said to the two of them before looking at Orochimaru. All right, I agree. Tobarama nodded his head, still a bit confused about the situation, but understood that it would be best to talk about it later. Meanwhile, Hashirama had a small smile on his face as he stared at Araki. He raised his hand and placed it on top of Araki's head, as if patting him gently. I saw you when you were so little. It is my regret that I hadn't been able to spoil you, Araki. Upon hearing these words, the look in Araki's eyes changed a little. In those words, he felt nothing but a strange, unconditional love for him. We will catch up later, Grandpa, he said to Hashirama with a low voice. After that, he stared at Madara with a cold look in his eyes. As for you, Madara, I killed you earlier and frankly speaking, you weren't a challenge at all. Because you had been reanimated, you aren't at the peak of your power. In your current state, you can't pose a challenge to me. Araki said it quite confidently while looking at Madara. Hmm, that might be true. Considering that I have been revived in this body, it meant that you destroyed my corpse immediately, huh? Madara said to Araki while still having that smile on his face. 
He slowly walked forwards with his eyes changing from three Tomo Sharingan to Eternal Manjiku Sharingan. Even Madara was well aware that Araki was using Sage Mode right now. Moreover, the Sage Mode was quite similar yet somehow stronger than Hashirama's Sage Mode. It would be a bad idea to not fight him using full power. So what? Araki responded to Madara's words while staring at him. Hashirama and Tobarama stepped in front of Araki, as if preparing to fight against Madara. Once I knew of your presence, I knew it would affect my plan sooner or later. So, I naturally made some preparations beforehand. Hashirama, I guess I can say that you have a rather talented descendant. He dances as good as you. Madara seemed to praise Araki while staring at Hashirama. What do you mean Madara? Hashirama asked, confused at Araki and Madara's conversation. Not just Hashirama and Tobarama though, even Orochimaru was confused. This wasn't what he had been told by the Black Zetsu. Anyway, Senju Araki, was it? There is something you miscalculated though. Madara said while his eyes transformed into Rinnegan at the next step he took. Those eyes, Araki's eyes widened immediately, and he was sure that the true user of Nagato's Rinnegan was in fact, Madara. Do you know, there is a brat with my eyes living at this moment. I was the one who implanted the Rinnegan in his eyes. My plan was going fine, but after I came to know of your presence and your talent, I tweaked it a little. Either the Black Zetsu would force that brat to revive me using Ghetto Art of Rinne Rebirth. And if my body was completely destroyed by you, Black Zetsu would give some of my flesh to Orochimaru or some other shinobi and use Edo Tensei Jutsu. After I was revived in this body, I could make use of that seal in that brat's heart and control his body for some moments. Black Zetsu can do the rest. You get what I mean now, right? Madara was awfully kind as he explained his plan with a smile. It was because he was confident that even if he revealed it to them right now, they could do nothing. Shit! Araki's eyes widened in shock as he used his sage mode and encompassed the whole land of fire within it. There he felt it, the presence of Black Zetsu. Moreover, it was on top of Nagato's body. This was bad. Orochimaru's eyes widened at the same time as he raised his hand to control Madara and stop him from casting this jutsu but alas, he was too late for that. Madara raised a single hand seal before speaking. Ghetto, Rinne Tensei no jutsu. The wood clone left in the Senju clan manor immediately moved towards Nagato's current location. But he was too late. By the time Araki's wood clone reached that location, Nagato's eyes were missing, and a lot of his life force was gone. Araki gritted his teeth and understood that Black Zetsu, Madara had even retaken his Rinnegan. This was the first time someone had happened so out of his expectations. Reanimating Madara? That was also fine, but this revival? This was not something Araki had thought of. Most of it was because he had no idea that Rinnegan could even revive people. If he had known that, he could have considered that Madara was going to use it to revive himself. He then remembered Madara's last words before he had died. We shall meet again, Senju Araki. For now, Araki's wood clone decided to take Nagato's body to the location where he could inject the life force into his body. He could feel that Nagato's life force was quite weak. At the same time, in front of Hashirama, Tobarama, Orochimaru, and Araki, Achiha Madara was revived. Madara's body was somehow growing stronger. His chakra was nearly ten times denser than before. This chakra, Madara is reaching the peak of his power. Hashirama looked startled as just like Araki. He was in his sage mode as well and could feel Madara's chakra. Even Tobarama looked quite serious. He knew full well of how powerful Madara was at the peak of his power. Other than Hashirama, not a single shinobi could hold a candle to him. Araki's eyes landed on Orochimaru and noticed that the snake was trying to get away. He immediately created a wood clone and sent it after Orochimaru. Considering that it was a wood clone enhanced by sage mode, it shouldn't take long to catch up with Orochimaru and kill him. While Madara was enjoying his revival, Araki and Hashirama disappeared from their position. Araki had pulled out his sword in the middle of his way and slashed at Madara's chest. Meanwhile, Hashirama was a little slower, but he swung his fist at Madara, intending of giving him a strong blow. 
Araki felt his blade inuring Madara. Even Hashirama's fist connected with Madara's chest. But Madara didn't move from that spot. Madara spoke with a faint smile. He, this pain, this is quite delighting. This is the body I wanted. Only when the blood pumps through the body can one feel truly feel their existence. And Hashirama, it appears you can't use your peak strength in Edo Tensei. Araki though didn't stop and raised his sword to thrust into Madara's chest and kill him. Just when the blade was about to pierce his chest, Madara moved his hand and caught the blade. Surprisingly, he felt quite a lot of strength being exerted by Araki. He spoke while keeping his eyes closed. Your Senjutsu is quite powerful. This was all Madara commented before he took a deep breath. Araki and Hashirama's eyes widened, and they simultaneously jumped back while using the same Jutsu, Sage Artwood style, Tree Wall Barrier, Fire style, Majestic Destroyer Flame. Meanwhile, Madara let out a sea of flames from his mouth which collided against the tree wall raised by Hashirama and Araki. Once Madara was done with his jutsu, black smoke enveloped the entire area. At that moment, Araki and Hashirama felt a kanai flying past them. It soon reached Madara's position, and Tobarama suddenly appeared at his kanai's location, wielding a blade, using flying Raijin jutsu. Perhaps he wanted to pierce Madara's chest with his blade. Madara frowned upon sensing Tobarama's chakra. This was the flying Raijin Jutsu. He kept that kanai and used his other hand to punch Tobarama's body. Tobarama was thrown back by Madara's punch. Hashirama appeared right behind him and caught him. Hashirama stared at Madara before speaking out. Madara, what do you want to do right now? Our time has long ended. Hashirama, I will correct your error. Your philosophy was flawed. I will lead the world to true peace. True peace. Hashirama frowned upon hearing Madara's words. He couldn't help but feel that something was wrong, but he couldn't place his finger over it. Araki continued to stare at Madara, a little relieved in his heart. Madara was truly strong, but not someone he couldn't fight. Grandpa, do you want to use that jutsu? Hashirama blankly stared at Araki for some moments before he understood. A smile appeared, and he replied, Why not? I hope you can keep up. Speak for yourself, old man. With that, the two clapped their hands in perfect synchronization while speaking. Sage art would style. Deep forest emergence. With that, the two would style users used a lot of their chakra. They created a sea of trees in that area, encompassing nearly 10 miles of radius around themselves. The trees near Madara's body held him tightly. Madara was able to break past three or so of them, but five would constrict him. These trees seemed to be never-ending. Araki raised his hand seal and said with a smirk, Now, for my personal favorite, explode. The trees holding Madara glowed for a few seconds before it immediately exploded. Hashirama looked amused upon seeing this technique. He had sensed what Araki had done. This was the same way Hashirama would explode the heads of the wood dragons. To see Araki using it with the deep forest emergence though. Quite a control indeed. Tobarama still had his frown while his Edo Tensei body was regenerated. This was not enough. Madara is still there. I know. Araki responded while staring at the smoke. A blue aura appeared with Madara within the humanoid version of Susanoo. That was quite a good warm-up. Madara said while cracking his neck. The humanoid version of Susanoo moved towards Araki. Hashirama, and Tobarama. The Suna Shinobi were startled to see the humanoid version of Susanoo, and Kashiro let out a sigh once he saw it. He truly has returned from the grave, Achiha Madara. The Suna Shinobi were nearly done by now. Some of their higher-ranked Shinobi escaped with Kazakage. They were well aware that without their Kazakage, they couldn't win this battle. To stop Kashiro, the one-tailed Jinchuriki was left behind along with a few shinobi from the Suna while the others were returning back to Suna. Hashirama was about to use his wood golem jutsu to counter Madara. Still, Madara's Susanoo suddenly turned to another direction and started running with a quick speed. Huh? What? The one who was the most shocked was Hashirama. He was well aware of how much Madara despised running away from the battlefield. 
Araki was the one who understood. Oh shit, he is going towards Black Zetsu's location. He wants to take his rin again. Araki used the trees around to restrain Madara's Susanoo, but they weren't able to stop him at all. Even without his eyes, it was as if he could see clearly and knew exactly what to do. Sage art with style, with dragon jutsu, three wood dragons appeared underneath their feet as they followed after Madara. Alas, they were too late. By the time the three arrived, Madara had grabbed hold of his Rinnegan from Black Zetsu and placed them in his eyes. Now, let's get serious, shall we? Madara seemed to be asking with a faint smirk on his face. He made a few hand seals before speaking. Summoning Jutsu, Ghetto Statue. Araki was on top of his wood dragon, and he suddenly felt a strong suction power trying to pull out the Jubi's husk from his body. However, he stomped on the head of the wood dragon rather strongly and condensed all his chakra on top of the ghetto statue. He was going against the summoning of the ghetto statue from the Rinnegan user. Moreover, that Rinnegan user was Achiha Madara. Hashirama noticed that his grandson was in pain and was about to jump on Araki's wood dragon and help him out. Still, soon enough, Araki's expression turned to normal. Madara frowned upon seeing this scene to think that he failed to summon the ghetto statue. Moreover, Araki's facial changes. He had a faint idea of what had happened. You really are quite daring. You sealed the ghetto statue in your body to make sure I couldn't get my hands on it. Huh. Madara asked with a rather amused tone. Araki retorted in return. It can't be helped. I knew you would return someday, but I didn't know the method you would use. I even thought I had destroyed any chances of your revival, but clearly, I was getting ahead of myself. Well, this is quite surprising. It looks as if I will have to extract the ghetto statue from your body, Madara said while staring at the wood dragons. Huh? What's this? Araki wondered as he felt a presence coming near his wood dragon. A wood clone was created out of the wood dragon and immediately moved forward to throw out palm in empty air. Yet even though the wood clone had attacked in empty air, it appeared as if the wood clone hit something. It was quite strange. Madara had a neutral look on his face. But internally, he was thinking, Ho, oh, he can even sense my limbo? From Hashirama's expression, it appears that even he can faintly sense it. Still, Tobarama cannot sense it despite being a sensor. It appears the sage mode is more useful than I expected. Tobarama created a huge water dragon jutsu and attacked Madara directly. Madara raised his arm and looked at Tobarama. Rinnegan can absorb all jutsu. The water dragon jutsu was directly absorbed by Madara. Hashirama continued to stare at Madara. He was well aware that the three of them couldn't win against Madara at this moment. Madara was near the peak or perhaps even beyond the peak of his power. Hashirama and Tobarama were in Edo Tensei state. If they had been revived like Madara, at that time, Hashirama could indeed defeat him. But at this moment, Hashirama and Tobarama were not even at their 120th or 110th level respectively. He then stared at Araki. Although Araki appeared to be calm, Hashirama could feel that he was really anxious at this moment. Araki was stronger than Hashirama and Tobarama's current state, but even this wasn't enough to defeat Madara. This time, I won't be out of steps, Senju Araki. Let's fight to our heart's content and get that score settled. Madara said as the blue aura started to release from his body. The humanoid Susanoo was soon formed. But this wasn't the end. Just after the humanoid Susanoo was formed, the blue aura continued to release out of his body. The body was quite huge and easily dwarfed anything Araki had seen. This was Madara's armored Susanoo which had appeared with a tiger seal. Madara clenched his fist as he said, Not enough. Settle down. This colossal amount of chakra started to settle down, and soon enough, it formed a long Tengu-like nose. Wing appeared behind the back of this perfect Susanoo, and a sword in its scabbard. The Susanoo slowly pulled out the sword from his scabbard, and Madara said, Now then, let's get started, shall we? Araki wasn't frightened by this Susanoo. He clapped his hands together and said, Sage art with style. Wood golem jutsu. A wood golem appeared underneath Araki's feet. Hashirama wanted to do the same and help him out. But Araki said, Grandpa, 
Stay out of the way. Since Madara has revived because of my error, I don't want any interruptions from anyone. I will deal with him by myself. I hope you can back your words, brat. The Susanu moved forward and struck Araki's wood golem. It shook up the wood golem and forced it to back away a few steps. A wood dragon was created and coiled around the neck of the wood golem. Araki raised his hand and attacked the perfect Susanu. But even as it struck the perfect Susanu, there was simply no damage to the Susanu. Although it was to be expected, it still made Araki frown. Your step was too weak. Try again, brat. Madara was exuding an aura of confidence while staring at Araki. Araki frowned but didn't care much. The wood golem attacked the Susanu and struck it, but it was like trying to push a wall. The perfect Susanu wouldn't budge. Instead, the perfect Susanu dispersed the sword in its hand and grabbed hold of the wood golem's sides and started to rotate it around. After 10 seconds, Madara threw the wood golem to Hashirama and Tobarama's direction. Hashirama controlled the wood dragons underneath his own and Tobarama's feet to dodge the wood golem coming at their direction. Although the wood golem had been thrown with quite some momentum, Araki made it stand up once again. This fight was far from over. At this moment, Hashirama shouted at Araki, Araki, you can't beat him using wood golem jutsu. His perfect Susanu is even stronger than the time when he first fought me with it. To defeat him, you need to give him a blow of absolute power. You get what I meant, right? Araki frowned for some moments before saying, Grandfather, go to the Kanoha's direction. Make sure to protect it from the shockwave. Hashirama and Tobarama nodded at those words before Tobarama stepped next to Hashirama and touched his body. He used the flying Raijin Jutsu to disappear. Tobarama had already sent his shadow clone with the marking of the flying Raijin Jutsu. He was somewhat prepared for this situation. After seeing his grandfather and granduncle disappear, Araki stared at Madara who was approaching him rather slowly. I didn't want to use this jutsu since it uses a lot of my chakra in one go. The ghetto statue could use that chance to take over my body. But, there is no choice. I need to defeat Madara right now. He joined his hand as if in prayer and shouted, Senpo Mokuta, Shin Sasenju, Sage Art, with style, true several thousand hands. A titanic wooden statue was created. The size of this titanic statue was such that it easily dwarfed Madara's complete body Susanu. In fact, Madara had to look up to see the full height of the statue. Thousands of hands emerged from the back of this statue in countless centric rows. Its main hands were clasped, as if in prayer. Araki stood on top of the wood golem which was on top of the head of the statue. Araki stared looked down at Madara, who was within his perfect Susanu. Madara, since you have forced me to use this, don't expect any mercy. Regret that you aren't an Edo Tensei at this moment. The wings behind the Susanu made it start flying. Madara rushed towards the wooden statue. He was personally well aware of how strong this technique was. If not for this technique, would he have lost against Hashirama when Susanu and QB had been combined? No. From the start of the battle, this was the first time Madara was showing a slightly anxious appearance. The Susanu raised its hand and formed a hand seal. The Ngai Shinsei. Heaven concealed. Araki sensed it. A huge meteor was coming down right at his location. And not just that, Madara also charged at Araki at the same time. Since that's how it's going to be then, fuck it. Araki seemed annoyed that Madara was throwing so many jutsus, which demanded a colossal amount of chakra, at him as if it was nothing. Sage art with style, would clone jutsu. A wood clone appeared next to Araki with a lot of chakra. He gave the nod to Araki before a blue ball started shining on top of his hand. He mumbled with a soft voice, Sage Art Wind Style, Titanic Raisingan. The blue sphere was growing in size. In just 10 or so seconds, it was infused with all of Araki's remaining chakra and even with some of his life force. This blue sphere was large enough that it was nearly one-third of the meteor's size. There was also a trace of a ring around this blue sphere which couldn't be seen unless one stared at it with special eyes. The wood clone just had enough chakra to throw this blue sphere at the incoming meteor and dispersed. The blue sphere reached the meteor soon enough, 
and the ring around it was becoming visible as it started to cut apart the meteor. When Araki felt that the moment was right, he clenched his fist and mumbled, Now! Explode! Immediately, the titanic Raisingan which was tearing apart the meteor shone with a bright light, and it exploded. The explosion was large enough to cover the entire meteor and more. Even Hashirama and Tobarama and the Tsuna Shinobi returning to their hometown felt the shockwave of that explosion. The people inside the Kanoha were utterly shaken up as they felt this tremor. They got out of their house and saw a humongous wooden statue with thousands of hands in a distance. The size of the wooden statue was so huge that they couldn't even see the Susanoo on the other side. The clouds in the sky seemed to have cleared after this explosion. Only a blue sky without a single cloud could be seen above the land of fire at this moment. Madara frowned upon seeing that his meteor was destroyed. He had used a single hand seal using the perfect Susanu. Perhaps he should have summoned more. He was also quite surprised to see that Araki was actually using such demanding jutsus in succession. He didn't have Hashirama's chakra reserves, so this should already be his limit. Araki's eyes showed a trace of tiredness. This really was his limit. The Sage Chakra was dispersing now since he didn't have Chakra remaining his body to keep the Sage Chakra balanced. Madara's Susanu soon clashed with the titanic wooden statue. Yasaka Magatama was released from his hand as it hit the wooden statue, but it didn't damage it too much. Just took out a couple of hands. The Susanu pulled out its sword from its sheath once again. Thousands of hands behind the wooden statue struck the Susanu, even Madara, couldn't do anything but cut apart three or so hands, but five more wooden hands would strike the Susanu before exploding. Just like that, a series of explosions started to occur as thousands of hands struck Susanu. It wouldn't be wrong to say that Madara's Susanu had become a punching bag. It had broken off from quite a few places because of the power of these punches and explosions. These series of explosions were so strong that even Kashiro, who was somewhat far away from their location, felt the shockwaves. The same was the state of the people of Kanoha. The shockwaves shook the earth, and these vibrations could be felt near Aim and Sakumo's camp. They had no idea what was going on, but it was like an earthquake had occurred. Hashirama and Tobarama had used a lot of their chakra to contain the shockwaves of these explosions using the earth release so that it wouldn't damage the Kanoha. Currently, just these shockwaves were strong enough to turn the entire Kanoha into rubble. Hashirama's face held a frown even though he was somewhat happy to see his grandson performing this technique. It was because he could clearly sense his grandson's chakra level. It had entirely exhausted. Hashirama was sure that Araki couldn't even enter into sage mode for some time. However, he let out a sigh of relief when he felt Madara's presence getting weaker as well. Unlike the previous time this mode had been used against Madara, Madara's Susanu was strengthened with Kyubi. So, even though Hashirama had won against Madara, Madara still somehow managed to escape without much injuries. However, this wasn't the same now. This time, Madara was inflicted with fierce injuries. Even with Rinnegan, he shouldn't be able to heal them quickly. Tobarama. He called out for Tobarama, who immediately understood what his elder brother wanted to say without any further instruction. The two teleported and appeared at the location where Araki had used the wooden statue. Madara laid there quite a lot weakened. His armor and everything had vanished, his right hand had been destroyed, and a lot of his bones were broken. He was bleeding heavily. If it continued, he would die soon enough. At that time, though, Hashirama saw it. His own face on Madara's bare chest. His eyes widened slightly before his gaze turned towards Araki. Hashirama sent his own chakra within Araki's body and tried to wake him up. But at this moment, Araki was in a dark space. This was the same location when his consciousness had entered the ghetto statue for the first time. Unlike the first time though, this time Araki heard a gentle voice. I will be retaking the chakra and your body now, Hagoromo, no Azura's descendant. Araki heard that voice and looked up where he saw a faint visage of a long white-haired woman with Byakugan and a Rinisharingan with nine tomo on her forehead. Araki was a little surprised because he never expected the Tentails to be a woman. She was quite beautiful. So, you are the Tentails, huh? Well, sorry to inform you, you aren't taking anything from me. But, I can't say the same about you. 
Araki said before raising his hand and saying, Kai! A huge amount of life force and chakra was injected into Araki's body. This was the life force and chakra which had been extracted from those 300 or so trees where he killed Danzo and his men. Right now, this life force and chakra rejuvenated him back to half of his full strength. The woman with the Byakugan's eyes widened as she understood this was a trap. Araki had been waiting for the consciousness in the Ten Tails to reveal herself. Upon seeing that she was trying to escape, Araki let out a cold humph. You think you can escape now when I was the one who planned for this moment? How naive. Simply by the pressure of his pure chakra, he prevented the woman from leaving. To think this pitiful amount of chakra is binding me. She seemed to be cursing her weakness at this moment since she didn't have a lot of chakra. A wood branch extended from Araki's hand and pierced this visage. He started to absorb this consciousness. Noticing that Araki's chakra had suddenly stabilized as a huge amount of chakra was unsealed from one of his seals. Hashirama and Tobarama let out a breath of relief. Hashirama started walking towards Madara then. Let's kill him now, elder brother, Tobarama said since this was indeed the best chance to kill Madara. No, let me talk to him. I want to know his motives first. Hashirama shook his head before informing Tobarama of his desire. Tobarama didn't try to stop Hashirama. He was well aware of how stubborn his elder brother was. The most he could do was stay by his side cautiously. Hashirama stared at the injured body of Madara and noticed a smile, which made it seem as if he was happy yet bitter about this fight. Hashirama? Who? Hmm. Hashirama let out a grunt in agreement before speaking. Madara, tell me what happened between you and Araki. Perhaps it was because Madara was defeated or perhaps he was tired. He opened his mouth. He started explaining. Let me start from how I survived the final battle against you, Hashirama. With that, Madara went on speaking about how he had survived the final battle against Hashirama using Izanagi and sacrificing his right eye. It was unknown why he was taking the trouble to explain everything to Hashirama and Tobarama. Madara explained how he had substituted his body with his shadow clone and implanted Hashirama's cells into his body, which he had a bit from Hashirama's arm in their final battle. Near the end of his life, he had awakened it, the Rinnegan. He had attained the power of the legend named Sage of the Six Paths, Hagoromo Atsutsuki. He mentioned how Hashirama's ideology was flawed. Wars occurred once again even though with Hashirama's actions, it should have settled down in peace. Humanity is the name of an animal that cannot find joy without suffering. That is why I was planning on removing this suffering with my infinite Tsukuyami. Madara mentioned that he was planning to cast a Jinjutsu over the whole world, let them all dream of their own ideal lives, while he was managing their bodies which had been cast into infinite Tsukuyami. The world would finally be at peace. There would be no ongoing wars. At this, Hashirama stayed quiet for a long time. He was well aware of his friend Madara. He knew that Madara wouldn't lie at this point. At least about his ideals, he wouldn't lie. He knew Madara was someone who found a thrill in a fight. Perhaps it was because of his Uchiha blood or just his character, but he found immense joy at fighting against someone with his full strength. The satisfied look on Madara's face showed that he truly was happy after having fought against Araki. But he was bitter about it since he couldn't put his plan into motion now. The fact that Madara was putting infinite Tsukuyami on the whole world meant that he was planning on becoming an overseer who would watch over the bodies of all the people trapped inside the infinite Tsukuyami. To the Madara who loved to fight, this was nothing sort of torture. Just what would he do without any fighting? Not an individual to talk to, simply roaming in the empty world. Yet, he was willing to go through that to bring peace in the world. Perhaps this was something that once again showed Hashirama just why he had become friends with Madara in the first place. The man was ready to do anything to bring peace to the world, even if it was going against the whole world. Madara wasn't finished though, he mentioned about how he met up with Araki for the first time. A fond smile appeared on Hashirama's face as he heard about Araki from Madara's mouth. Meanwhile, Tobarama had a grim look on his face. From what he understood, Kanoha had somehow betrayed the Uzumaki clan at the end of the Second Shinobi War. Moreover, it was none other than his students, 
Danzo and Haruzen, who had done it. This made him frown a lot. Hashirama was also quite angry to think Haruzen would give up on the Uzumaki clan. If Madara had spoken about the Uchiha clan receiving scorn from Kanoha, perhaps only Hashirama would have frowned or become angry, since Hashirama had always told Tobarama and Haruzen to stay neutral while deciding on Uchiha clan's matters. But it seemed that even the Uzumaki clan wasn't spared. Hashirama felt quite apologetic to his wife. Perhaps if he had been stricter, they would have heeded his words more. Meanwhile, Tobarama really felt like reviving the monkey and beating the shit out of him. He also understood why Araki had killed the monkey. Madara also mentioned that Araki came a second time to meet him after he found out that Madara had implanted Hashirama's cells into himself. Madara mentioned that time it was his own mortal body which gave out. If not, he shouldn't have much issue in killing Araki. Ho! Oh. Really? Even though you are in such a state, you are still begging for a beating Madara. Hashirama said quite gently. But those who knew him, they shivered, whether it was Madara or Tobarama. Well, Madara chuckled a bit later. You really haven't changed, Hashirama. Hashirama didn't reply for some time. Well, you know the rest by now, Madara said to Hashirama. Hashirama let out a sigh. You know Madara, it appears we both have failed in our dreams. Your dream was to create a peaceful world through oppression and pure power while mine was through being optimistic and as you say naive peaceful ways. I even gave away the tailed beasts for that cause. But, now I realize that it should have been better if I had spent more time cultivating the next generation. If I had focused more on that, Kanoha wouldn't have betrayed Yuzushio. Hashirama looked quite sad as he mentioned that. I guess this is the end. Huh. Madara said before he slowly closed his eyes. Hashirama continued to stare at his corpse before letting out a sigh. Our age has passed. This is the age of the next generation. Our presence was never welcomed here. Madara closed his eyes as half of his blood flowed out of his body. Madara was slowly losing consciousness. Meanwhile, Araki slowly opened his eyes. He looked around and found that this was somewhat strange. It felt as though his sight had improved. He had no idea that he had red-colored eyes with rippled pattern within them. The Crimson Rinnegan. Araki felt that he was unconsciously channeling chakra into his eyes and stopped doing that. His Crimson Rinnegan dispersed, and his eyes returned to normal. Atsutsuki Kagaya. And that black Zetsu. The son of Atsutsuki Kagaya created from her will. Araki then went into sage mode, and this time, he felt that his sensing range could cover half of the world. He felt the presence of Black Zetsu. Creating a wood clone, he sent it towards the location of the Black Zetsu. It shouldn't be hard to capture him now that he knew exactly what it was. Meanwhile, Araki turned towards Hashirama and Tobarama who were standing close to Madara's body. So, you still aren't dead, huh Madara? Araki spoke out while walking to their position. Madara weakly turned his head to stare at Araki. Maybe I should have prepared more for this dance. Araki shrugged in response while staring at Madara. Well, it's a good thing you failed in your plan of infinite Tsukuyami. What do you mean? Madara asked him a little curiously and weakly. To this, Araki said one thing. The black Zetsu was Kagaya's son created out of her will when she was sealed by the Sage of the Six Paths. He was planning on making you use infinite Tsukuyami to revive Kagaya. Madara was naturally smart enough to understand everything else. So, it was a dead end no matter what I did, huh? Even Hashirama and Tobarama were surprised at Araki's words. Tobarama asked him a little curiously, And how do you know that? Kagaya is, in fact, the Jubi. Her consciousness does reside in it. She tried to take my chakra and body when I had fallen unconscious. Still, I had prepared a seal which contained a lot of life force and chakra to rejuvenate myself at such a time. Once I recovered my strength, how could she escape from me? Araki said with a smile, I have more or less absorbed her memories. I just need time to go through them all. I see, Tobarama said while staring at Araki. Araki stared at Madara who had nearly died. You gave your own Rinnegan to Nagato. Unless you have his original eyes stored somewhere, I will be giving him the Rinnegan again. 
Araki informed Madara, who gave a subtle nod. With that, Madara had died again, and this time he was truly dead. Araki stared at Hashirama and Tobarama and said to the two, Let's catch up, shall we, Grandpa, Granduncle? Hashirama and Tobarama nodded their heads. Although they heard a lot about him from Madara's mouth, they still wanted to talk with him about his life. While Araki had started to talk with his family members, his wood clone had caught the Black Zetsu. Black Zetsu let out a snarl as he stared at Araki. You! You can't do anything to me. I will escape your grasp sooner or later. Not if I annihilate you first. The wood clone's eyes transformed into Crimson Rinnegan as he stared at the Black Zetsu. Meanwhile, Araki was surprised when he suddenly received live footage of seeing Black Zetsu while talking with Hashirama and Tobarama. It appeared as if he was using Rinnegan. He thought, I see now, Kagaya Atsutsuki's Rinnesharingan. It has somehow awakened Rinnegan or maybe Rinnesharingan in both my eyes. But this is not the full power of her Rinnesharingan. I need the chakra of all the nine bijus to reach her level of strength and surpass it. However, he didn't forget about the matter at hand. He stared at the Black Zetsu and said, Black Zetsu, the third son of Kagaya Atsusuki. A huge blue sphere started shinning up top of his hand. This was Sage Mode Enhanced Raisingan. This probably isn't enough to kill you completely, Araki said while staring at the Black Zetsu in his hand. That is why. A greenish glow spread over the pure blue chakra. This was nothing other than the Mokutan chakra. Wood style. It's capable of suppressing the tailed beasts because the tailed beasts were formed by the divine tree Shinju. My wood style. It's nearly at the same level or even stronger than the wood style of the divine tree right now. With this, I am sure your existence will be utterly annihilated. Black Zetsu had a frown on his face as he continued to hear Araki's words. Why you? How do you know all this? Welps, those were your last words. Bye. With that, Araki extended his arm and hit the Black Zetsu with his Mokutan Enhanced Raisingan. The Black Zetsu's existence felt immense pain. Perhaps this was the first time it was feeling pain, so it couldn't even hold back its loud scream. Araki let out a smile. Ah, I nearly forgot how melodious the screams of enemies are. Thanks for reminding me. Slowly but surely, the Black Zetsu's existence was slowly getting destroyed. After having destroyed the Black Zetsu, the wood clone was pretty much done. That was a lot easier. So what should I do? Should I pursue that snake? Araki wondered in his head, wondering if he should pursue Orochimaru or not. When he had fallen unconscious, all his wood clones had dispersed. So, Orochimaru had managed to escape. Considering that Orochimaru's mindscape still had that trace of Araki's chakra, Araki could indeed sense Orochimaru's position right now. Orochimaru was running towards the Kumogakure village. Mm, Kumo will be my next target. I will deal with him at that time. Since I know of his Edo Tensei Jutsu, I can easily deal with it the next time. Right now, the better thing would be to meet up with Shikaku. Araki thought while turning off his Crimson Rinnegan. Araki was running towards the direction the one-tailed Jinchuriki was running. It seemed that Kashiro and the other Kanoha clans had forced the Sunagakure to flee. However, there was another situation going on right now. Many of the Kanoha's clans had received a heavy blow from this invasion. Currently, they were in the confusion of what would happen now that the Hokage was dead. Who will lead Kanoha? Other than a few, many of the clan heads had the ambition to become the Hokage. If they become the Hokage, they could strengthen their clan even further. Moreover, they were all incredibly prideful of themselves and felt that they could lead Kanoha to glory. However, there existed a small issue. While many of the clan members had died, the one with the least casualties was the Uchiha clan. They were well aware that unless the Senju clan stepped inside, the one who would become the next Hokage would be Uchiha Kashiro. This was something many of them were unable to see. That is why, without even speaking, all the clan heads wanting to become Hokage had joined hands together to suppress the Uchiha clan first before dealing with each other. They were also scared of the power shown by Uchiha Kashiro and wanted to deal with him first. Right now, Uchiha Kashiro looked quite tired. It should be easy to deal with him, that's what they believed. 
Araki's would clone naturally noticed this commotion as he was chasing after the one-tailed Jinchuriki. The wood clone created another wood clone. One wood clone was chasing after the one-tailed Jinchuriki. At the same time, the other wood clone jumped right next to the clan heads who were trying to suppress Uchiha Kashiro and the Uchiha clan. Hello, Kashiro. Araki's wood clone greeted him with a smile. Instantly, all the remaining clan members turned to his direction. His appearance was somewhat surprising at this moment. Senju Araki. The Hyuga clan head shuddered out while staring at Araki. Perhaps he didn't think Araki would appear at this time. Not just the Hyuga clan head, but a lot of people shuddered. They had naturally felt the explosions of the fight. Although they couldn't see the fight, they knew it was someone strong. All these clan members had seen a huge meteor, a colossal blue-colored Susanoo. Although they didn't know whose it was, it was huge. But these two were not the things that shocked them. It was the presence of even more humongous wood statue that could be seen from far away. Perhaps this was one of the reasons why Suna Shinobi retreated as quickly. That wood statue was so huge that even that colossal Susanoo seemed a puny thing in comparison. And there was something that all people in Kanoha were aware of. Only a single man in the entire world had wood release, and it was none other than the current Senju clan head, Senju Araki. And all these clan members could agree that fighting against him was simply suicide. That is why, even if they had ten times more courage, they wouldn't fight against him. So, you really dealt with him? Huh? Kashiro asked quite naturally. Araki raised his brows and slowly nodded. It seemed that Kashiro was aware of quite a lot of things. He even knew that it was Madara who had been revived. He looked at the other clan heads. Hmm. Quite a lot of you survived. So, then, what were you all planning to do now? Nearly all the clan heads present at this moment were sweating. They didn't know why but just with Araki standing there, they felt a strange sense of suffocation. And Araki wasn't even using chakra at this moment, it was just his presence. They felt vastly inferior to him. It was none other than the Hyuga clan head, who stepped forward despite this strange pressure and spoke, Nothing much, Araki Dano. It's just that you have killed the third Hokage. We understand that you had your personal grudges against him. But it brings the issue of who will become the Hokage and administer the village. If we let it remain as it is, the village could break apart. Kumo and IWA might use this to destroy it down to roots. Perhaps it was because he was the head of the third strongest clan in Kanoha. So the Hyuga clan head's words were spoken calmly as he managed to successfully hide his nervousness while standing in front of Araki. This sort of calmness even received the praise from all the other shinobi around them except for the members of the Uchiha clan who just snorted in response. Araki let out a chuckle. Indeed, I naturally understand how dire the situation is. However, don't worry about it too much. As the Senju clan head, I hold power over who should be appointed as the acting Hokage during the time of emergency. I am sure you are all aware of such a rule. Naturally, I am. That is why, I wish to ask you who would you choose as the acting Hokage? The Hyuga clan head couldn't conceal a hint of anxiousness as he asked Araki. Who do you think is the most qualified for the position of the Hokage? Araki asked him with a bit of an amused smile. This... The Hyuga clan head was confused as he couldn't understand Araki's intent behind asking this question. He would appear far too shameless if he stated his own name. Or did Araki want him to state someone else's name? But fortunately, the clan heads around him weren't stupid. The Inazuka clan head, Aburaim clan head, Kahaku clan head, and the Anakuma clan head slowly stepped forwards. Inazuka clan head said, I believe Hyuga Hideki Dano is perfect for the job as acting Hokage. I believe the same. The same for me. Slowly but surely, they started to voice out their thoughts. Only three clan heads remained silent at this point. The Nara clan head, the Akimichi clan head, and the Yamanaka clan head. They didn't seem to have any ambition in becoming Hokage, nor were they interested in voicing out their support for the Hyuga clan head. To them, it didn't matter much. As long as the chosen Hokage was fair to their clan, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. They also had no feud with either the Hyuga clan or the Uchiha clan, so there was no way either of them would target them. I see. 
Tell me, Hyuga Hideki, excluding the Senju clan, can you confidently say that you can defeat anyone in Konoha in a one-on-one -on -one battle? Araki said while staring at the Hyuga clan head. I. Just when the Hyuga clan head was about to speak, he paused. He remembered the presence of Uchiha Kashiro. Other than receiving the support of the clans in Konoha, you also need to be sufficiently strong. And in my eyes, you are still inferior to a lot of people. Whether they be Jiraiya, my own sensei Hataki Sakumo, and Uchiha Kashiro, if you disagree with me, you and he can fight now. I will provide him chakra so that it's equal to your own. All the clan heads can witness the fight between the two of you. Isn't it quite fair? Araki asked the Hyuga Hideki. If it was before fighting against the sudden invasion from Sunagakure, the Hyuga clan head would have immediately agreed to fight against Uchiha Kashiro to prove that he was the strongest in Konoha if Jiraiya, Sakumo, and the whole Senju clan was to be excluded. But now, he no longer had any confidence in defeating Kashiro. He had personally seen the Susanu. It was contending against a full one-tailed bijou. That red-colored Susanu seemed to be protecting him from all kinds of attacks of a bijou. Use Taijutsu against that Susanu and attempt to break it? That was a joke. Who knows how many Sunagakure shinobi had died as they attempted it. Although the Hyuga clan head was quite confident of his strength, how could he even show off his gentle fist's true powers if he couldn't even touch Kashiro's body? His Byakugan would be virtually useless. See, you can't even confidently say that you would win against Kashiro. Araki then turned towards Kashiro and asks him, How about you? To this, Kashiro said a bit mildly, As long as it's not you, I will win no matter who I am up against. Perhaps his words were spoken arrogantly, but this still surprised the clan members around them. The Hyuga clan head was about to speak something. Still, Araki was faster and said, Before you all say anything, I have already asked Jiraiya and my sensei Hataki Sakumo. Both of them have no interest in the position of the Hokage. So, my choice should be apparent now, shouldn't it? Hyuga Hideki's expression twitched a little at these words. This wasn't good. Seeing as all the clan heads were silent, Araki turned his head towards Kashiro and said to him with a smile, Congrats Kashiro, you are the first acting Hokage of Konoha. The other clan heads could only helplessly stare at Araki and then at Kashiro, who said, Thank you for giving me this chance, Araki Dano. I will show you that I was the right person for this. Araki shrugged in response compared to what everyone thought he cared little about this. But he couldn't say that having an acquaintance as the Hokage wasn't without its perks. All right, you can all return to your clan compounds now, Araki said before walking past them all. He touched Kashiro's shoulder and transferred a bit of his own chakra to Kashiro. Kashiro was internally thankful to Araki. He knew Araki didn't need to do this but still, he was showing such consideration for the Uchiha clan. With this, the thought of attacking Kashiro on their return way completely vanished from the minds of the Hyuga clan head and the other clan heads supporting the Hyuga clan. The other wood clone of Araki was pursuing the one-tailed Jinchuriki named Ishimoto Sadao. He was with a few other Sanagakure shinobi, but they were not important in Araki's eyes. They might as well not have been present at all. Even with Ishimoto Sadao, Araki wasn't in the mood of any talk. He pulled out the sword resting in his scabbard. The wind chakra covered his whole sword as Araki's speed suddenly doubled. Before any of the Suna shinobi realized anything, Araki was ahead of them and Ishimoto Sadao's head was rolling on the ground. For some seconds, the Sanagakure shinobi didn't even realize what was wrong. Their minds soon registered the presence of Araki in front of them. They came to an abrupt halt. These Sanagakure shinobis had seen him earlier when he had come to fight against the third Hokage. These Sanagakure shinobi had stayed near the end with Ishimoto Sadao and seen the titanic wooden statue. It had dwarfed the Susanu by far. They turned towards Ishimoto Sadao and noticed that he wasn't by their side. They slowly turned more until half their body was rotated. Quite a bit behind them, the Sanagakure shinobi saw it. Ishimoto Sadao's head was on the ground and his body was even more behind. Being so careless in front of an enemy? Araki let out a sigh. These Sanagakure shinobi were so stupid that he didn't even feel like killing them. Just go. 
He felt as if these people were so pitiful that it would be better to let them leave. To the one-tailed Bijou, one of them still gathered his courage and spoke to Araki. Hmm? I see. Go and inform your Kazakage that one tails no longer belongs to Sunagakure. If he has an issue, he can come directly to me. Now go! He said the last part while releasing his aura. These Sunagakure shinobi were scared as heck. And they immediately left. To meet Senju Araki and escape with their lives intact. Nothing could be better than this. As for the one-tailed beast, they ultimately felt that it wasn't their problem. The Kazakage should think about it. After these shinobis left, Araki walked to Ishimoto Sadao's body. He could feel a faint trace of the one-tails being released into the surroundings. If this continued, it would take a year to two for the one-tailed beast to take form. This sort of time wasn't something Araki wanted to wait. I guess I will do it forcefully. The first thing he did was let his chakra enter Ishimoto Sadao's body. He accelerated the release of the one-tailed bijou. He used a lot of his chakra to compress it so that the one-tailed beast came to his original shape. Normally, this sort of thing was nearly impossible to achieve for anyone. But, Araki's chakra was so dense that it could even suppress the one-tailed beast's chakra. In a span of half an hour or so, the one-tailed took shape. At the least, the outline of the one-tailed beast had congealed now. Araki continued to assist the one-tails for some more time before he stopped. He noticed that the one-tails was curiously staring at him. Send you Araki, aren't you? What do you want from me? You said to those Sunagakure shinobi that I no longer belong to them. Does that mean you want to take me to Kanoha? Although quite aware of Araki's power, the one-tails still showed him quite a lot of hostility. In response, Araki smiled and said, You don't need to be that worried. You are free from now on, Shikaku. How do you know my name? Shikaku asked, quite startled that Araki knew of his name. Well, Kurama didn't exactly hide your name from me, Araki replied to Shikaku's question quite casually. That fox, you even know his name? Shikaku was even more startled now. He was well aware that between the tailed beast, it had the most arrogance. For Kurama to have told his name to Araki, well, I like to call him a friend. Kurama is free as well. He is roaming in the land of fire, careful to not catch someone's attention while searching for a resting place. Araki mentioned it to Shikaku who looked so surprised that he didn't say anything. Araki then smirked while looking at Shikaku. But still, I didn't think your appearance to be this cute. Maybe instead of giving you freedom, I should take you to Kushina. She will definitely be happy to have a cute pet raccoon. Since one tails hadn't completely congealed, it was in his young form the form in which it had been created by the Sage of the Six Paths. Well, it could certainly be called cute. No, I am not cute. Shikaku really wanted to attack Araki for these words at the moment. Well, his words made it seem even more adorable. And Araki just laughed out loud. Sure, you aren't. All right, I guess I will get to the point now. All traces of lightheartedness vanished from Araki's face as a serious look appeared on his face. I will be freeing all the tailed beasts in the elemental nations. At the end of the third shinobi war, I will send you a signal. I want you to come to the designated point. There, you will meet all your siblings. What do you want by gathering us all? Shikaku asked a little curiously. To get the chakra of all nine of you, Araki said. Not at all concealing anything from Shikaku. And before Shikaku misunderstood, he added, I mean getting chakra from the nine of you, but I won't be absorbing you completely. For others, it will be one-tailed worth of their chakra, and as for you, it will be half your chakra. Hearing Araki, Shikaku was a little annoyed as it seemed as if Araki was rubbing the fact that Shikaku had only one tail. Why don't you take my chakra right now? You are certainly strong enough to absorb it forcefully. Shikaku asked Araki, wondering quite curiously. Araki nodded his head and replied calmly, Well, that's one option, but I would feel better if you will be willing to give it on your own accord. I don't have any hatred for the tailed beasts, and I would like to keep it that way. But if a tailed beast does resist, I won't be making any promises. So, is it a deal? Araki asked Shikaku who still wasn't sure. 
If the other Bijus are also free and we meet during that time, I will agree to give you my chakra, Shikaku promised Araki. The reason Shikaku promised Araki even though he didn't personally know Araki was because he knew of his name. This was just one reason. The other reason was that Araki didn't take his chakra forcefully. And the last reason was that, even though the hope was faint, Shikaku did want the other-tailed beasts to be free and meet them again. They rarely met in that other dimension. This promise was good enough for Araki. He stepped forward and touched Shikaku's sandy body. He sent quite a bit of his chakra to Shikaku's body. I have given you quite a lot of my chakra and compressed it deep within your body. If you need my help, send a pulse of chakra to it. My wood clone would appear immediately, and it should deal with most threats. And once the third shinobi war has ended, the wood clone would pop out and lead you to the location. Araki said to Shikaku. Shikaku soundlessly nodded his head and then started to concentrate on extracting his own chakra and compressing it to increase the size of his own body. The wood clone dispersed after having accomplished its objective. Araki was talking with Hashirama and Tobarama. Although Hashirama and Tobarama heard a lot about his story from Madara's mouth, hearing it from Araki's mouth give them his own perspective. They understood a lot more about what Haruzen and Danzo had done. To this, Tobarama couldn't help but sigh with disappointment. Did I make a mistake in judging their characters? Or perhaps my death gave a bigger shock to Haruzen than I anticipated. He had become quite cowardly. You can't be entirely blamed about this matter, Tobarama. I am equally to blame. It should have been my job in guiding the young generation, but I failed in that aspect. Just as I said to Madara, his and my own philosophy and ideology had failed. I was far too optimistic of the future that I ignored or maybe turned a blind eye to the troubles which could arise. Hashirama said with a hint of melancholy in his voice. Hearing the two speak, Araki remained quiet for some moments before speaking up. Grandpa, granduncle, I do understand that you are disappointed. I can't say that I am happy with your choices either. You both have made a couple of mistakes, perhaps blunders. However, I am also aware that even if you took all sorts of precautions, the situation wouldn't have changed much. If not now, the same thing could have occurred a few generations later. The Uzumaki clan wouldn't have someone like me to protect them at that time. So, blaming yourself is also not right. Perhaps Araki's words weren't the best for consoling someone. It certainly did the trick as he spoke to Hashirama and Tobarama. To think my grandson would be consoling me. You really have grown up from that tiny size. Hashirama said with a smile on his face. He gently patted Araki's head. Araki was a little shy as his head was patted by Hashirama. Ever since he was little and heard of his grandfather's legends, he always wanted to spend time with him like this, to think that his wish was being fulfilled right now. The loving smile on Hashirama's face seemed to be radiating an unconditional love. I won't ask you to forgive any of the villages for their actions. I am a dead man. I have no right to interfere with the living world again. Also, just like mercy is necessary, heavy punishment is also obligatory. I simply hope that you do not take your anger on the innocent people, Hashirama said, quite gently to Araki. Araki gave him a nod while replying, I will keep it in my mind, Grandpa. I will also be correcting your mistake of giving away the tailed beast. All the tailed beasts are going to be free, never to be captured again by anyone. Hashirama nodded his head, quite satisfied with Araki's response. All right then, I guess it's time for the two of us to be released from the Edo Tensei. Hashirama said to Araki and Tobarama nodded in agreement. Araki was a little startled as he said, Wait, why are you going so soon? I wanted to take you to the Senju clan manor and let you meet with my wife. She is an Uzumaki, and, and you haven't even met up with Tsunade. Hashirama stayed quiet, and it was Tobarama who said, we must not stay in the living world any longer. After having met you, elder brother and I already want to revive and live in this world. If we make any more connections, that desire would only grow stronger. It would be best if no one other than you knows of this. It's time for us to go. Tobarama had spoken quite sternly. Araki stayed quiet in turn. He was quite sad after hearing this. 
but he understood what his granduncle wanted to say. Meeting you had already been a lot for us. Take care of yourself, Hashirama said before turning to Tobarama. Tobarama raised his hands and started doing a lot of hand seals. After some time, he performed all the hand seals and said, Edo Tensei, Kai. Hashirama and Tobarama's body started crumbling as papers fell down. Soon enough, their bodies transformed into the bodies of the shinobi who had been sacrificed to revive these two. Araki didn't give it much thought and destroyed the bodies of these two shinobi. Well then, let's return the Rinnegan eyes to Nagato first before starting to figure out the powers of my own Rinnegan. Araki thought as he was quite curious about the powers of his Rinnegan. He wasn't going to mention anything about Hashirama and Tobarama. Still, he guessed that he might have to mention Madara since the huge shockwave was something that must have been felt by everyone in Kanoha or perhaps even the nearby villages. Firstly, he went to Nagato's side, who was still unconscious. It was Araki's wood clone who had hit him to make him fall unconscious. Currently, he was laying at the location where Araki's trees containing life essence were there. Since Araki had extracted quite a lot of life essence from these trees, it had been exhausted by now. Araki appeared to Nagato's side and implanted the Rinnegan in his eye sockets. After having implanted the Rinnegan, he sent his chakra in Nagato's body and felt the eye quickly connecting to the nerves in Nagato's eyes. The Rinnegan had connected much more suitably than before. He let Nagato sleep for some time. He wondered if his friends were searching for him right now. Fortunately, Nagato was training alone when Black Zetsu had taken over Nagato's body and forced him to use Rinari Birth Jutsu and then taken his eyes. Or else, the two would have been badly injured or even killed. Now that nearly everything was settled, Araki took Nagato's body to the Akatsuki residence. There, the Akatsuki could take care of him. Araki would explain to him what happened later. And Araki himself returned to the Senju clan manor. There, Araki met an anxious Kushina and Tsunade and many other Uzumaki clan members. Araki, you finally returned. Kushina let out a breath of relief before jumping forwards to hug him tightly. She had quite a rack right now, and it squeezed against Araki's chest. Araki faintly blushed before returning her hug. Don't worry. I am fine now. Nothing has happened to me. But what happened? I was in the sage mode and sensed some huge amount of chakra. One of them was even larger than yours. And then, your chakra even lowered to a considerable level. I wanted to come and help you, but your wood clone had mentioned that I must not come at all costs. This wasn't a fight I could come and interfere. I really had to hold myself back so that I don't come there. Let's get inside. I will explain everything to you. Araki said while proceeding to give them a story. It went on about how Orochimaru had summoned Madara. Madara had somehow revived himself using the Rinnegan held by Nagato. Madara got those Rinnegan eyes, and he was really strong. He had to use his strongest move against Madara's attacks. This was the wooden statue that they had seen from the Senju clan manor. After having answered a lot of their questions, Araki went outside. He was going towards the training ground. Araki created ten or so wood clones. All of them activated the Rinnegan by sending chakra in their eyes. Araki and his wood clones received ten or so images in each of their minds at the same time. And with that, each one started his own training to become proficient in the use of Rinnegan. Kagaya's memories were quite useful in that regard. Araki's Crimson Rinnegan had the power to open up dimensions, granting him complete control over all elements, giving him the gravitational power similar to Nagato, but quite a lot stronger than his powers. He could also control the soul, but he hadn't tried it right now, so he couldn't say he knew about it perfectly. He could mechanically alter his body and summon animals even though they weren't in contract with Araki. However, the strange thing was, after summoning them, they would have Rinnegan in their eyes showing. Araki also tried to absorb Jutsus. He realized that he could absorb Chakra from the Jutsu, but the Jutsu's physical mass would still hurt him. He also had the abilities of the Outer Path, but he had only tried to create Black Receivers which had his Chakra. After all, why would he try to summon the Ghetto Statue when it was sealed within himself? Anyway, while Araki was focusing on training his Rinnegan's abilities, 
The word rapidly spread about Sunagakir's sudden invasion and then the third Hokage's death. Although people were also curious about why Araki had, they had felt those fierce tremors that day and the humongous wooden statue, they just continued to think of the reason themselves. Even Sakumo and Jiraiya far away heard this information. Sakumo let out a sigh as he knew that Araki really did it. Moreover, he did it at such a delicate moment. But, he also heard that Uchiha Kashiro had been assigned as the acting Hokage by Araki. Sakumo and Jiraiya didn't have much of a complaint about an Uchiha becoming the acting Hokage. But many shinobis in Kanoha couldn't say they were happy about this. The entire Uchiha clan was celebrating. Well, Kashiro didn't want them to celebrate since the third shinobi war was still going on. But he couldn't really stop them all right now. These people were really adamant on celebrating. After spending some time with his father, who had been brought to the celebration, and his elder sister Makoto, he left the area. He had gone to the Hokage's office where many of the people stared at him with contempt visible in their eyes. This was something Kashiro knew he had to go through and endure. They naturally wouldn't hold him in high regard considering he had become the Hokage so suddenly and his position wasn't stable at all. The result of this war would decide whether he should remain as a Hokage or not. After checking out all the paperwork, Kashiro got to work. He sent multiple orders to the front line. One of them was to order Sukumo's camp to return and make a camp just a bit ahead of Kanoha. This confused Sukumo and all the other captains in his camp. Just why were they receiving an order to return? The other captains even started to say about how this acting Hokage would doom Kanoha. Even Sukumo shared their worries as he didn't want Kanoha to be destroyed. He was somewhat confused. Should he send the message back, asking for a reason? Or should he trust this judgment of Uchiha Kashiro? After contemplating it for some time, he gave the order. Let's trust the acting Hokage and pull back. I will take complete responsibility for this. Hi! All the shinobis in the camp had no trouble in placing their hopes on Sukumo. They were life and death brothers with him. How could they not trust him? Alright? Let's pack up and leave quietly. With that, Sukumo and all the other shinobi started packing up to return to Kanoha. It had merely been a week, but the news of the third Hokage's death had spread to all corners of the world. It could be called the courtesy of Orochimaru. Whether it was AIM, Kumo, IWA, or Kiri, all of them were utterly startled. This sudden death of the third Hokage was never expected by them. Hanzo was wondering just how the Hokage could die. But he had a faint idea about the person who killed the third Hokage. Currently, in Kanoha, only Senju Araki should possess the power to fight against the third Hokage and even win. Although this news delighted them, for some reason, the Kages of the Three Great Village couldn't help but shudder. This meant that the little boy they had seen at the Yuzushio had grown up. They were well aware that he was going to be a major threat to them now. A threat which was even greater than that of the third Hokage. They also heard that Uchiha Kashiro had become the acting Hokage. But, other than a few complications, they didn't care much about this fact. Now, they needed to research his abilities and other things. Just a few days after this one week, the envoy from Kanoha arrived to meet up with the Kages of the Kimogakure, the third Reikage. This envoy was sent by Kashiro. Third Reikage, I have been sent by the acting Hokage, Uchiha Kashiro to inform you that if you wish for a chance of survival, join hands with Kirigakure and Iwagakure and launch a full-scale attack at Kanahagakur. You have a week to join hands with Kirigakure and Iwagakure before this full-scale attack at Kanahagakur. If Kimogakure doesn't attack with Iwagakure and Kirigakure after two weeks, I have been told that Senju Araki-sama will personally visit the Kimogakure. Have a good day, third Reikage. With that, the envoy turned his head and returned. He was allowed to return because this envoy was a truly simple man with no special abilities or power. Even if Kumo captured him, the Kumo wouldn't gain anything, and Kanoha wouldn't lose anything. All the people present in the third Reikage's office stared at the third Reikage. The third Reikage slammed his hand over his table and crushed it. What utter disregard and humiliation! The third Reikage was truly angry as hell as he couldn't believe what the envoy from Kanoha had said. He had initially believed that the Kanoha might even give him some compensation and try to delay the final battle. But now, 
it seemed they had come to declare the full-scale war. Moreover, Kanoha even wanted to deal with them all at the same time. Just what sort of arrogance was this? However, the other shinobi in the rakage's office started to calm him down. They all gave their own suggestions, some suggesting him to ignore the words of this envoy, some suggesting him to at least talk to the Tsuchikage and the Mizukage. The third rakage felt that it was a blow to his pride. Still, he ultimately agreed to their suggestion of at least informing the other two kages. A few of the shinobi in his room also said to him that Kanoha was becoming far too arrogant. With the entire strength of three great villages, it should finally be put into its place. They mentioned how Kanoha had just fought against the Suna's sudden invasion, it should be the perfect opportunity to launch a full-scale war against Kanoha. But, not a single person knew that full-scale war was just a scam. From Kanoha's side, only Senju Araki would be coming up to meet the three great villages' allied forces. A week later, the third Reikage organized a meeting with the third Tsuchikage and the third Mizukage. The meeting was taking place in the land of the waterfall, near the Takigekyur village. This time, even the village head of the Takigekyur had been invited. This was on the recommendation of one of the third Reikage's advisor's suggestion. Although reluctant, the third Reikage listened to his advisor's suggestion and invited the village head of the Takigekyur. It wouldn't be a bad idea to enhance their numbers even more. The current leader of the Takigekyur was Heisen. He was also the one who personally knew the Jinchuriki of the Seven Tails, Shu. The Seven Tails was quite different from its siblings. Unlike them, it didn't have much issue in sharing its power with its Jinchuriki. Moreover, it maintained a good relationship with its Jinchuriki. His personality was quite happy-go-lucky. Both Heisen and Shu were in the room where the Kages of the Three Great Village had also taken their seats. Behind Kages were their advisors and other shinobi who came as their guards. The first one to speak was the third Mizukage. He stared at the third Reikage and the third Tsuchikage before speaking. Greetings, Reikage Dano, Tsuchikage Dano. The three of us hadn't had this kind of meeting since the time when we joined hands to destroy Yuzushio. This was a sore point for the third Reikage who grunted in response, while the third Tsuchikage merely nodded. So, what is the reason for Reikage Dano to call for not just myself and Tsuchikage Dano, but also Takikage Dano? The third Mizukage calmly asked the third Reikage. It felt as if the words flowed out of his mouth really naturally. The third Tsuchikage, Anoki spoke first. Is this meeting related to the death of the third Hokage and our next moves? I believe it would be better for us to wait for some time and check how this acting Hokage, Achihakashiro, does things. The third Reikage cleared his throat before speaking. Tsuchikage Dano, Mizukage Dano, Takigake Dano. The reason I have requested for this meeting is because of the envoy sent by Kanoha. The Reikage stopped speaking, and his advisor took it from there. The Reikage's advisor spoke word to word about what the Kanoha's envoy had spoken. While listening, all the three Kage other than the Reikage frowned. They furrowed their brows, wondering just why Kanoha would send such an arrogant message through an envoy. It was the third Mizukage who asked with a confused look on his face, why would Uchiha Kashiro send such a message through his envoy? The third Tsuchikage said, This could be Kanoha's tactic. Maybe they are hoping that the Kumo wouldn't join hands with IWA and Kiri, and instead wait for Senju Araki at Kumo. That, that is indeed a possibility. But the question remains, why would the Kanoha send Senju Araki to Kumo if Kumo doesn't launch a full-scale attack at Kanoha with IWA and Kiri? Are they that confident in Senju Araki's strength? That could be one reason. From what I have heard, it was Senju Araki who has indeed killed the third Hokage in a one and own battle. His strength will be nothing to scoff at. The one who spoke was none other than the third Tsuchikage. Humph! If Senju Araki thinks he can attack Kumokagir alone and hope to survive, then he is even more naive than I thought. He should better not underestimate Kumogakure. The third Reikage said with a hint of pride in his village. Perhaps that pride could also be interpreted as arrogance. The third Tsuchikage was well aware of how prideful the Reikage was of his own strength and his own village. But, unlike the third Reikage, the third Tsuchikage had seen a trace of the power held by the Uchiha Madara. And Senju Hashirama was said to be even stronger than Uchiha Madara. 
It definitely wouldn't do well to underestimate the only bloodline inheritor of the Senju Hashirama, who had grown strong enough to kill the third Hokage in a one-on-one -on -one battle. The third rakage wasn't finished though, he added soon enough. But, I also don't want Kumo to be the site which becomes the battlefield. The other Kages ignored this point. This was quite naturally, after all. No Kage would want their own village to be the site of the battlefield. I believe it would be better if we all join forces and destroy Kanoha in one go. The third Mizukage suddenly suggested to the other three Kages. And why would you suggest that, Mizukage Dano? It was the Takakage named Heisen who asked the question. It is because we cannot focus on just Senju Araki. Indeed, Senju Araki is quite strong, but I believe that it should be better to give a decisive blow to the Kanoha. The timing couldn't have been better, since a lot of clans other than the Uchiha clan received a lot of casualties from the sudden invasion of Sunagakure. The Mizukage calmly said, Since they have asked the Kumo to ally with Kiri and IWA, shouldn't it be taken that Kanoha is confident in giving us a good challenge? The third Tsuchikage spoke with a small frown. Perhaps they are. But tell me Tsuchikage Dano, are you not confident in crushing Kanoha if you are allied by two great villages and Takigakure? You must remember that in this battle, other than the nine-tailed Bijou of Kanoha and the one-tailed Bijou of Sunagakure, all the other tailed beasts are by our side. In terms of numbers, the combined army of all our villages should be strong enough to crush Kanoha. The Mizukage was done speaking. On this, the third Rakage, the third Suchikage could agree. At this moment, the Takakage, Heisen said, Not just that, we can also use some of our wealth to recruit some powerful shinobi. There is a former shinobi named Kakuzu of the Takigakure. He is a bounty hunter right now. He was someone who had exchanged blows with the first Hokage, Senju Hashirama. However, he barely escaped with his life, but there is no denying that he is quite powerful. The third Suchikage also said, I have also heard of Kakuzu, Strength is also nothing to scoff at, but his services are quite expensive. We can split the cost between ourselves. The four villages joined hands and decided to crush Kanoha with a full-scale attack as soon as possible. A week ago, within the Hokage's office, Kashiro was seated behind the Hokage's desk, wearing the trademark hat of a Hokage. Opposite to him sat Araki. So, you sure you don't need any assistance? Don't even think of sending any reinforcements. I will be taking my revenge personally. I won't tolerate anyone interfering. Hi hi. As Araki left the office, Kashiro let out a sigh while thinking, Father, your vision had an error. Senju Araki isn't just going to fight against the Kumo, but also against IWA and Kiri. His strength has gone far beyond what we expected even after overestimating him greatly. He sent the envoy to Kumo with this message. It had been two weeks since the Kumo received that envoy. Within the Senju clan training ground in Kanoha, a young man with long black hair was seated, a smile on his face. He slowly opened his eyes, and a crimson glow with three ripples could be seen. Now then, the time has finally come, and just as Araki had wanted, the three great villages and Takigakure's allied armies assembled in the Land of Lightning. From there, they started to make their way towards Kanoha. They were planning on making it a strong and swift invasion. To crush Kanoha in one go, all the Jinchurikis present within the Kumogakure, Iwagakure, Takigakure, and Kirigakure were present in this army. Even some mercenaries had joined them. Killer B was pretty much chilling while rapping and annoying the heck out of his elder brother. His elder brother I was resisting the urge to beat the heck out of his little brother. If only he could be serious at this moment. Well, he wasn't the only one being annoyed though. The eight-tailed bijou inside of B was even more annoyed. Now, although the eight-tailed bijou was annoyed, he did like this Jinchuriki a lot better than others. But he would never admit that to B though. Anyhow, it was the first time many of the Jinchuriki had met each other. They interacted among themselves. IWA had brought the Jinchurikis of the four-tailed and the five-tailed bijus. Kumo had brought the Jinchurikis of the two-tailed and eight-tailed bijus. Kiri had brought the Jinchurikis of the three-tailed and six-tailed bijus. And Taki had brought its seven-tailed bijus. 
None of these four villages planned to underestimate Kanoha. When they had attacked Yuzushio, they had seen that a village on the verge of destruction is capable of giving a fierce blow to their enemies. It would be best to bring out their entire firepower and kill them before Kanoha could counter. It was a simple but effective strategy. Indeed, if all the Jinchurikis could use tailed beast bombs, just what could the Kanoha do? The three Kages of the great villages had decided to fight against Araki. The Jinchurikis could fight against the other shinobi of Kanoha, including the acting Hokage. Yet, they had no idea that from the side of Kanoha, only a single man was coming. He was walking with a serene look on his face. His speed wasn't fast or low, just rather normal. Not a single ally could be seen near him. After half a day, these two sides did meet each other. Were the four Kages shocked upon seeing only Senju Araki? If so, the shock could barely be seen. A fierce wave of intense anger could be seen on their faces. Anger so great that their faces had turned red like a tomato. He wondered if he should have brought a few tomatoes to compare. It was the third Rakage who couldn't hold back his anger and shouted at Araki, Senju Araki, what is the meaning of this? Kanoha was the one who wanted to have a final frontal battle. Where is the Kanoha's army? Hmm? You think I will allow anyone from Kanoha to interfere with my revenge? Besides, it's not like anyone else's presence is required. Initially, I was thinking of sending a wood clone to destroy you all. It should have been strong enough to destroy you all. But I thought that revenge is best when taken personally. He had a ruthless expression on his face as he finally revealed his aura. The overbearing aura was so strong that many of the shinobi backed away just as this aura crushed their own and nearly brought them to their knees. Araki's steps were the same as before, calm. Not at all slow or in a rush. Yet, as he stepped forward, the three villages' allied army felt the pressure on their bodies increasing. This wasn't a jutsu. This was the pressure from pure chakra. This was the first time they had experienced such a feeling. The Kages of the three great villages had a grim look as they understood that Araki was not to be underestimated. At that moment, Araki added, Just me personally coming here is already giving you quite a lot of face. This was the last straw. The third rakage disappeared in a flash of black lightning. Not a single shinobi in this battlefield could have seen him move. Yet, the second all of them blinked, they saw the third rakage was standing near Senju Araki with his fists clenched. Araki's face had some reddish-brown markings as he held the third rakage's punches with that same calm expression as before. Are you that eager for death? Well, I guess it can't be helped. I will let go of you this time. Perform better next time, third rakage. I have a lot of hope from you. Araki said before giving a kick in the third rakage's gut and throwing him back to the three village shinobi alliance. The third rakage crashed into many shinobi behind him. These shinobi were quashed once the third rakage's body landed on them. They felt many of their bones cracking. Perhaps some of them had become cripples. Yet, this wasn't the most shocking thing. The one thing which shocked them all was that there was a red mark on the third rakage's gut. The markings of the Araki's kick. This meant that Araki's kick had not only pierced the lightning armor, but also damaged his otherwise known as invincible flesh. The third rakage slowly got up. He coughed out a little a drops of blood were leaked from his mouth. The Kumo Shinobi, who knew of the freakish body of the third rakage were alarmed as they thought collectively heavens. Just a casual kick from Senju Araki has damaged the invincible body of the third rakage. This, this is inconceivable. Not just the Kumo Shinobi, even the two Kages of the other two great villages were shocked. They were somewhat thankful that the third rakage was foolish enough to go attack Araki first. If they didn't know of it before, they could have just been seeking death while fighting Araki in close combat. The third Tsuchikage and the third Mizukage gave each other a subtle nod. Charge! They gave a swift order to all their armies. The third Tsuchikage, Anoki took off to the skies while the third Mizukage rushed towards Araki's location. All the armies followed them and rushed towards Araki. All those who have stepped up here, don't think that even one of you will survive. I will destroy each and every single one of you. Meanwhile, Araki slowly started to increase his speed of walking. Soon enough, 
He was running towards the three great villages Shinobi Alliance. Taki's presence was simply insignificant if the Seven Tails was to be excluded. Everyone, kill him. Don't even think of underestimating him. The third Suchikage let out a shout for everyone. He didn't want someone to become overly arrogant and fight against Senju Araki carelessly. The Kumo Shinobis had already seen what had happened to their own Kage. The third Rakage disdained to ask someone to heal him, it was because of his incomparable confidence in his body. Still, at this moment, he didn't stop the healing shinobi who had appeared and started healing him. Although their healing techniques couldn't be compared to Tsunade's or Araki's, they were still good enough to heal the small wound on the third rakage's body and suppress any internal injuries that occurred. Araki's speed was slowly increasing as he ran towards the three village shinobi alliance. The third Suchikage made a hand seal and created a small white cubic structure before speaking, dust style, particle dismantling jutsu, a beam of light shot towards Araki as it threatened to annihilate Araki's existence. Araki jumped in the air and dodged that beam of light. The beam of light hit the ground underneath his position and destroyed it down to tiny atoms. Araki stepped on the ground and slowly raised his head, staring at the third Suchikage for some moments and gave a smile. This man was going to be the most troublesome one. Sage Art Wind Style Thousand Blades Jutsu Instantly, Anoki felt as if a thousand blades of winds were coming at him. He quickly made a hand seal and spoke, Earth Style Rock Hard Body Earth Chakra quickly appeared over his body as he defended against the thousands of wind blades of Araki. But, the third Suchikage's jutsu was not enough to perfectly defend against the wind blades. Some of these wind blades did pierce the earth chakra covering his body and slashed his body. Meanwhile, the third Mizukage shouted, Water style, water dragon jutsu, using a water jutsu against me? Even my granduncle Tobarama's skill in water jutsu isn't enough to hurt me. You are even more insignificant. Araki said with a sneer as he saw the water dragon jutsu coming at him. The water dragon speed was quite fast, and it would strike Araki after just a couple of seconds. But strangely enough, when the water dragon was in 10 or so meters of Araki's range, the water dragon started to turn. To use long-ranged water attacks against me means your chakra must be stronger than mine to retain your control over it. So, tell me, third Mizukage, do you understand the difference between the two of us now? His question was left unanswered. Well, not because they wanted to ignore him, but more of because the water dragon was growing larger in size as it continued to charge at the third Mizukage. It seemed that the water dragon was absorbing the water chakra in the surrounding and growing stronger and larger. By the time it reached near Mizukage's location, it was tens of times stronger and larger than before. The Mizukage's original water dragon seemed to be a long python had now transformed into a huge true dragon. Not just the Mizukage, all the shinobi behind him sweat dropped nervously. At that moment, two individuals covered in chakra cloak stepped forward and said, Fire style. Fire dragon jutsu. Meanwhile, hundreds of shinobi stepped forward and shouted at the same time, Fire style. Fireball jutsu. The water dragon jutsu struck against two fire dragon and a lot of fireball jutsu. Well, this was indeed enough to overpower the water dragon jutsu and convert the water to steam. Sage Art Wind Style Raisin Shuriken A huge wind shuriken appeared, cutting apart the steam and targeting the large group of shinobi which had just used the fireball jutsu. Before they could get out of the way, the raisin shuriken was right beside them and... It exploded! It formed a light blue-colored sphere encompassing tens of meters around from the center. It destroyed the bodies of the shinobi within it with countless wind blades. The two shinobi who had used the fire dragon jutsu had already gotten away since they sensed a great danger from it. With that, Araki finally appeared from the steam. Before any kage could give out orders to their shinobi, Araki charged at them with almost blinding speed and started engaging them in a fierce taijutsu battle. His taijutsu style couldn't be called perfect or refined to perfection. But the sage mode enhanced his senses to such a level that he could feel the attacks before they reached him and react easily. His strength was so strong that just one punch from him was enough to kill them. 
and sometimes the person thrown away would take two or three of his comrades with him. The Taijutsu battle had gone on for nearly half an hour, and just in this half an hour, Araki had killed 2,000 shinobis, and his momentum was only increasing. At this moment, the third Suchikage, Mizukage, and the Rakage shouted out their orders at the same time, Get back now! Why the shinobi were asked to get back. They unconsciously turned towards the direction of the Rakage and saw Killer B in the second version transformation. Five-tailed in that mode as a small yet orange-colored condensed chakra was shot at Araki. Tailed Beast Bomb Araki faintly smiled upon seeing the tailed beast ball. It was highly condensed so that it wouldn't hurt the other shinobi around him. But still, the hundreds of shinobi stepped forward and used water style, water wall jutsu. Another hundred of shinobi from the other side stepped forward and used earth style, earth wall jutsu. Just like that, they prepared themselves for the explosive power and shockwave of the tailed beast bomb hitting Araki. Well, this can't really damage me, but I still don't like taking hits, even if it doesn't hurt me. Let me give you a taste of this tailed beast bomb. Sage art wood style, wood hand jutsu, a hand made of wood style was created. It appeared similar to the hand of the wood golem jutsu. The small tailed beast bomb was held tightly in the wooden hand. Araki controlled the wood hand and made it strike the earth wall users on his right side. The sage mode enhanced wood hand easily managed to pierce the earth wall raised by hundreds of shinobis. And before they could disperse, the wood hand reached down and struck the ground. As if it was all that was needed, the tailed beast bomb immediately exploded, taking away hundreds of shinobis with it. But Araki was given no time to breathe. He was attacked by a black lightning panther of the third rakage. Perhaps this was thrown at him because the third rakage didn't wish to fight a taijutsu battle against Araki for some time. Well, it didn't matter much to Araki. He stomped the ground, and an earth wall appeared in between the black lightning panther and himself. Even if this black lightning was ten times stronger, it still wouldn't be able to pierce the earth wall. Let me give you a present of my own rakage. As he finished speaking, the winds around Araki started moving violently. Sage Art Wind Style Twin Tornado Araki created two huge tornadoes of unknown height. The winds of these two tornadoes were so powerful that even the shinobi farthest from the tornado couldn't help but be sucked towards it. And as for the nearest, there was no need to even speak about them. They were no longer on the ground. Their bodies were flying high in the sky. They were rotating in these tornadoes so much that they were feeling dizzy. Let me add something spicy for you. I hope you all will like it. Sage Art Fire Style Majestic Flame Destroyer The two wind tornadoes created by Araki caught fire. Both of them were burning intensely. The flames were so intense that it burnt their entire bodies. They felt unbearable pain. And some weak-willed shinobis couldn't help but squeal out in pain. Ah! Stop! Please stop! Their begging was extremely pleasant. And Araki said with a massive grin on his face, Scream louder! I can't hear you! As the fire tornadoes burnt the shinobi at the rate of hundreds every ten seconds, many shinobi from the land of the water stepped forward, each one using their jutsu as if their life depended on it. Water style, water wall jutsu, hundreds of the water jutsus hit the twin fire tornadoes and managed to extinguish the fire by a small amount. At that moment, the third Suchikage and the third Mizukage both stepped forward towards these twin fire tornadoes. The third Suchikage was in the air while the third Mizukage on the ground. Dust style, atomic dismantling jutsu. One large cube covered one of the fire tornado and destroyed it completely. Araki faintly smiled upon seeing this. It seemed that the battle won't be as boring as he initially believed. Meanwhile, the third Mizukage stepped forward with some selected Kiri Shinobi. All of them were the elite Shinobi of his village. They all used the same water jutsu. Naturally, the Mizukage's jutsu was the strongest among them. Water style, giant vortex jutsu. Twenty or so huge projectiles were launched at the fire tornado at his side, and slowly but surely the fire tornado started losing the power. Araki mildly thought, Heh. The Mizukage is surely weaker than the third Suchikage and the third Rakage, but the quality of Shinobis under him isn't bad. 
At least, they seem to be at a higher tier than the third rakage and the third suchikage's forces. Well, this was mostly because of the schemes and policies of the second Mizukage, who had raised the quality of the Kirigakure Shinobi to a level somewhat above the Kumogakure and Iwagakure. One of the main reasons was the seven swordsmen of Kiri. Currently, all seven of them had stepped forward and used the giant vortex jutsu, which had extinguished the fire tornado. Meanwhile, Araki hadn't been given a break right as the fire tornado vanished. He was fighting against a few other shinobis. As he was fighting against the shinobi, he saw someone with green eyes and a mask covering half of his face. Not hesitating at all, Araki punched him away and started fighting against other shinobi. However, he could still sense life force from that green-eyed person he had punched away a few seconds ago. That was a little strange. Araki didn't think that someone had this sort of ability as well. A little interested in knowing of this technique, he decided to end the other shinobi around him quickly. Sage Art Giant Raisingan A gigantic Raisingan appeared on top of his palm, and he jumped a little high before using it on the ground. The explosion and the shockwave were enough to send most of the shinobi flying away. Araki turned towards that green-eyed man and raised his brow as he saw that man's body stitched with strings. This man was Kakuzu, the bounty hunter hired by Kiri, IWA, and Kumo. Araki's punch from before seemed to have split off Kakuzu's upper body from his lower body. The strings were extending from his upper body and connecting with the strings of his lower body. And here I thought only Orochimaru was the one with ugly jutsus. I guess you aren't far off. Araki let out a sigh while staring at the sorry excuse of his body. You are truly just as strong as I expected, Senju Araki. This won't be enough to kill me, though. I survived a battle against Senju Hashirama. You should do better than that to kill me. If you can, that is... Kakuzu seemed to be taunting Araki while his body returned to normal. You merely survived a battle against my grandfather, and you think you pose a challenge to me? Fufu ha 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 ha. Araki's loud laugh started to resound on the entire battlefield. It was seemingly like that of a maniac right now. Ha ha ha. Damn, that was good. You nearly killed me with those jokes. Perhaps I might leave a text in the Uzumaki records about how I send you Araki nearly died of laughter. Ha 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 ha. Araki once again started to laugh. Kakuzu frowned a little before speaking up. Earth style. Iron skin. Both his hands darkened as he rushed towards Araki with his enhanced skin. The wind mask behind his back released some wind chakra, which propelled him towards Araki. Take this. Kakuzu let out a shout as he punched Araki's face as hard as he could. Kakuzu's punch enhanced by the iron skin jutsu was naturally strong. As his hand struck Araki's face, the shock of that punch could be felt from some distance. Yet, there was no joy in Kakuzu's eyes even though his blow had landed on target. There was only a deep fear. Araki glared at him fiercely for a moment. That moment was enough for Kakuzu to experience such great pressure over his body that he nearly kneeled down in submission. Was that all you had? Araki asked him, still maintain the cold and hard stare. Kakuzu gulped down in response and backed away before Araki could hit him. Earth style, earth grudge fear. Four of his masks separated from his back and were congealed with black threats. Each jumped at Araki, seemingly intent on fighting against him. Araki didn't move from his position, as if he waiting for them all to attack him. Wind style, open destruction, fire style, cranium craver. The first jutsu that Kakuzu used against Araki was the wind style. Araki made no attempt to dodge it. The highly compressed wind jutsu was combined with the fire jutsu, and its power increased substantially. The jutsu struck Araki's body and created a loud explosion. Dust clouds blinded people and prevented them from knowing just what had occurred. What was Senju Araki's current status? Lightning style. False darkness. Kakuzu was still not done, though. He used another jutsu and targeted Araki while the dust cloud was up. The lightning shot towards the dust cloud and tore it apart. Soon enough, the dust cloud dispersed, and everyone who neared Araki saw him standing there completely unharmed as the lightning dispersed before it hit Araki. I asked you, was that all you had? 
Araki once again spoke with that cold look in his eyes. And then, he finally moved. Kakuzu recalled the masks to his body and was about to think of another tactic that Araki was suddenly in front of him. Let me show you the true difference between us. Araki spoke, his pressure forcing Kakuzu to remain immobile. Before he even realized it, his face was grabbed by Araki. You didn't survive the battle against my grandfather, you were given another chance of living. The chance which you have wasted by choosing to fight against me. Wind style, thousand blades, compressed state. At that moment, Kakuzu felt thousands of blades cutting apart his skin, his threads, and his hearts, all at the same time. His threads were naturally moving, trying to connect again, but they were cut apart into smaller pieces even quicker. For the next five or so seconds, Kakuzu literally felt thousands of blades cutting him apart into tinier pieces. His body was cut apart into so many tiny pieces that Araki couldn't even hold his face any longer as it had fallen apart. Now, to burn the trash, fire style, great fireball jutsu, Araki let out a huge flame that burnt up Kakuzu's whole body. After having destroyed Kakuzu's whole body, Araki remembered something. Hmm? I forgot to get his name. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. With that, Araki started fighting against the other shinobi, nearing him and those who had finally finished with the hand seals and could use their jutsu. The next ones to meet Araki on the battlefield were none other than Jinchuriki, led by the third Rakage and his son named Ai. The third Rakage was in his black lightning armor and a cautious expression on his face while staring at Araki. The shinobi around Araki had withdrawn to some range since they didn't want to get caught in this battle. It would be better to protect the third Suchikage and the third Mizukage, who were recovering their chakra right now. They could still fight, but they believed that going up against Araki in this state was no better than signing a death contract. It was better to quickly get to their peak condition. They were sure that seven Jinchurikis plus the third Rakage and his son should be able to hold back Araki for some time. Araki stared at this line up with some interest in his eyes. All the Jinchurikis other than Killer B were in their version 1 mode, meaning they were only wearing a cloak of chakra around themselves, while the Killer B was in his version 2 mode with four tails. They all charged at Araki at nearly the same time. The first one who got to exchange blows with Araki was naturally Killer B. In his version 2 mode and using four tails, he was faster than the other Jinchuriki in their version 1 mode. Araki stomped on the ground and charged at Killer B as well. Their fists struck against each other head-on. Upon contact, Killer B was utterly shocked when he felt the bones in his arms cracking just after receiving Araki's punch with his own. The only one stronger than him in his version 2 mode was his brother Ai and his father, the third Rakage. Yet, Killer B felt his bones crack a little just now. Fortunately, the tailed beast chakra was already working on it and healing it. Just as Araki had clashed against Killer B, he raised his arm and blocked another blow from the four-tailed Jinchuriki. Take this! The five-tailed Jinchuriki immediately followed and attacked Araki right after Araki had blocked a blow from the four-tailed Jinchuriki. Araki grabbed hold of the four-tailed Jinchuriki's arm and suddenly flung him towards the five-tailed Jinchuriki. The five-tailed Jinchuriki was startled, but he couldn't change his direction in mid-air. After his body was struck by the four-tailed Jinchuriki, Araki suddenly appeared beneath them and kicked the back of the four-tailed Jinchuriki so strongly that the two went vertically up in the sky. Before Killer B could do anything, Araki gave him a tornado kick and threw him away. Araki slowly landed on the ground. He then looked up in the sky with a faint trace of a smile on his face. He was staring at the four-tailed Jinchuriki and the five-tailed Jinchuriki. Flying Claw! This was the attack of none other than the two-tailed Jinchuriki who was coming to hit Araki. Araki disappeared from his position. Many of them were confused about where he was. They turned their heads to the sides and could no longer see him. At that moment, the third Rakage shouted, In the air! There! All the shinobi raised their heads and saw Araki in the air. There was a blue sphere of chakra in his hands. The blue sphere was getting stronger while he stared at the four-tailed and the five-tailed Jinchurikis. He was seemingly flying right next to their position. When both of them tried to hit him and thrown him towards the ground, 
a wood clone appeared in the air and blocked their attacks. Meanwhile, Araki had finished adding the wind attribute to his Raisingan. He smiled sadistically and said, I hope you survive. Well, that was a lie, but you get what I mean, right? The wood clone suddenly dispersed. Before the five-tailed Jinchuriki and the four-tailed Jinchuriki could register his words, they were hit by the sage art. Dual wind and fire style. Giant Raisingan. This was as large as the giant Raisingan with wind ring and fire rings revolving around it. Araki threw this jutsu, and both the Jinchurikis crashed against the ground. The moment their bodies had crashed against the ground, the Raisingan generated a gigantic explosion. The explosion was huge, even taking the three-tailed and the six-tailed Jinchuriki with them. Within this explosion, the four Jinchuriki caught up in this blast radius were hit with scorching flames and sharp wind blades. The blast was so strong that even the tailed beast chakra cloak had dispersed. But, they were unwilling to let it end like this. They released more of the tailed beast chakra and started to undergo the tailed beast mode. The tailed beast mode was gigantic in terms of size nearing the perfect Susanoo in terms of height. Right now, for Jinchurikis had completely transformed. While landing on the ground, he saw the two-tailed Jinchuriki and the eight-tailed Jinchuriki seemingly waiting for him at his landing location. Waiting for me? That was a bad idea. Sage Art would style. Would hammer Jutsu. Two wood hammers were created with his Jutsu and appeared in both his hands. Upon seeing that Araki was going to attack them with wood hammers, the two-tailed Jinchuriki lit her entire body with blue flames and prepared to defend against this attack and then attack him right after it. Tentacles appeared form Killer B's body as he prepared to take on Araki's hammer as well. Both Araki's hammers struck the hand-coated with the blue flames and three tentacles of the eight tails respectively. Just when they were about to attack Araki, they felt the sudden suppression of their chakra and the wooden hammers hit their head so hard that they felt their entire body shaking upon impact. Double Lariat. Both the third rakage and his son appeared. The third rakage in front while his son behind Araki. The two wanted to crush Araki from both front and back. Araki was about to jump away and dodge this attack when he suddenly felt two strong earth hands holding his feet. Quite a significant amount of chakra was being sent through these earth hands. From the chakra, he could feel that this was none other than the third Suchikage's chakra. Heh. This is pretty good teamwork. It would have worked against me if I didn't have Sage Mode. But right now. Suddenly, the third rakage, his son were both punched by some mysterious energy. This mysterious energy was Nature Chakra. Araki had punched the two away using Nature Chakra. And Araki slowly tried to move his feet. The earth hands which were holding his feet started to break apart. The third Suchikage was doing his best to keep his hold over Araki. And he shouted at everyone. Now! Transform. Attack him with your strongest jutsu. All the Jinchurikis heard his order and transformed to their tailed beast mode. The four tailed beasts were already charging the Bijudama and three more Jinchuriki followed them. Seven tailed beast bombs were thrown at Senju Araki while he was somewhat immobilized. Yet, there was not a trace of worry on his face. He didn't even try to use any jutsu. As the shinobis all around them were anxiously staring at the Bijudama thrown at Araki, they wondered if this would be enough to finish him off for good. Yet, at that moment, the seven Bijudamas were struck by seven Bijudama from the opposite direction, just a little smaller than the Bijudamas from the seven-tailed beasts. Before the Bijudama could hit Araki, they exploded on their way. Nearly everyone on the battlefield covered their eyes as they saw this explosion. It was far too bright for them to see anything. It appears that you are in a tight spot, Araki. A deep voice, filled with some excitement, was heard by all the shinobi on the battlefield. They unconsciously felt some fear creep inside their heart as they turned their heads to the direction of this voice. You came, huh? There was a trace of a smile on Araki's face as he turned towards the direction of the voice as well. Karama. Sure enough, the nine-tailed fox, large enough to be larger than the size of the other tailed beasts, Nine Tails Beast had arrived. Moreover, it seemed to have arrived so secretly that only Araki, who was using Sage Mode felt him appear, and not someone else. Well, the Tailed Beasts did feel Karama near their location, but they didn't think Karama was coming to assist Araki. 
They didn't know how he got his freedom but didn't care too much at the moment. They believed it was a coincidence for him to be here. They were well aware of his pride. He wouldn't help out a human. Yet now, Karama had appeared. Moreover, he had appeared intending to help Araki. Just what was going on? Karama's appearance wasn't just a shock for the seven Jinchurikis and the tailed beasts. It was shocking for all the shinobis, including the Kages. They never expected the nine-tailed Jinchuriki to appear right now. While Karama had a proud look on his face as he kept walking towards Araki's position, Araki said with a small smile, Well, there was no need for you to come right now. This wasn't a threat to me. Heh, I don't doubt that. But it would be a pity to miss this party. Isn't that right, siblings? Karama's last question was directed at the other tailed beasts within the seven Jinchurikis. At that moment, the four tailed Jinchuriki spoke. You, how are you free? Why don't I feel the presence of your Jinchuriki? Did you manage to regain your freedom? How? It was clear that the Sun Goku had switched with his Jinchuriki to talk with Araki. Karama snorted in turn and said, Why should I tell you? At this moment, Araki had gotten out of the earth hands of the third Suchikic. He stared at Karama and said to him, I was about to suppress the Jinchurikis with the wood release, but since you have appeared, that's also good. With a serious look, Araki said to Karama, Karama, you can have full reign over the Jinchurikis, they have your siblings inside them after all. I don't care what happens to them, whether they die or not. Not a single attack should hit the other shinobi here. They are my personal targets. Tith H. Way to spoil the fun. Karama looked disappointed that he wouldn't get to destroy the humans but ultimately obeyed Araki's words. Karama disappeared from his position and charged into the eight-tailed octopus and threw him far away from the battlefield. He did the same thing to the other tailed beasts. The four tails, Son Goku, grabbed hold of Karama, but Karama still managed to use his tail to sweep him away. After that, another lightning fast quick threw him to the other siblings. There was a merciless grin on Karama's face. It has been a long time since I disciplined you all at the same time. Now then, let's start. With this, the strongest bijou started to show its supremacy over the other tailed beasts, fighting seven of them at the same time. All the seven Jinchuriki shuddered upon seeing the wide grin on Karama's face. They had a bad feeling about it, but they still decided to fight against Karama. Meanwhile, Araki decided to focus more on the fight against the third Rakage and his son, Ai. Both of them were clad in their lightning armor. But they had realized now, Araki was stronger than them, but his speed was a little slower. However, the Sage Mode seemed to allow him to predict their moves to some extent and perform faster reactions. Araki jumped to their location with a small grin on his face. While I was fumbling a little, the third Rakage stepped forward to meet Araki with his strongest attacks. Thrust of Hell Two Finger Mode The third Rakage didn't dare to use Four Finger Mode on Araki. He was well aware that he needed a strong piercing power to defeat Araki at this point. Araki raised his brow as he noticed the third Rakage's two fingers clad in black lightning. That was a little interesting. A wind sphere on top of his hand. It was quite similar to Razengan, but the difference was that it was made entirely of wind in the form of a sphere. Araki's wind sphere contacted the third Rakage's thrust of hell and was surprisingly equal in terms of power. Noting that they were nearly equal in terms of power, the third Rakage switched to the one finger mode. The strength of his jutsu surpassed what Araki estimated. It was nearly five times stronger than before. As the wind sphere was close to dispersing, Araki had a hint of anxiousness on his face. This jutsu could indeed injure him, sage art wind style. Wind bullet jutsu. He took in a large amount of wind in his mouth and threw out multiple bullets at the third rakage's body. Enhanced by the sage chakra, these wind bullets managed to pierce the third Rakage's lightning armor. Although it didn't hurt his body, he was still pushed back by the power of these wind bullets. Just as his thrust of hell faltered, Araki jumped back a little. This time, when he backed away, I suddenly appeared behind his back while clad in lightning armor. Lariat. Sage art wind style. Wind armor. Offensive mode. The wind chakra around him suddenly compressed to an incomprehensible level. 
However, I still didn't feel any threat from this wind chakra and continued with his attack. Just when his arm was about to touch Araki's back, he felt multiple blades cutting his skin apart. It was as if there was a film of wind chakra protecting Araki's body. It appeared similar to their own lightning armor. The pain made him falter a little, and this moment was enough for Araki to turn around. He gave a strong kick to Ice Head, and Ice Body was thrown far away. I crashed against the bodies of the shinobi who were arriving to help him out. It was quite ironic since instead of helping I, they were injured by Ice Body. Araki once again felt the presence of the Black Lightning Panther. It seems the third rakage wasn't planning on letting go of this chain attack. Well then, time to change the scenery, he said, while clapping his hands and speaking, sage art with style, deep forest emergence, from under the earth, thousands of wood branches started to grow. Each one of them seemed to possess a lot of chakra. As soon as it struck the shinobi who were somewhat dumbfounded at the large scale of the jutsu, they felt their chakra being sucked by these vines. It took some seconds for the respective kages to give orders and start cutting the vines. However, Araki smirked at this moment and he said, Offensive formation, wood dragon mode. The chakra these vines had absorbed transformed their shape in the wood dragons. Now, they were much more durable and had an extra skill that Araki could use at any time. His one and only favorite, explosion. All the Kages of the Great Villages had seen these wood dragons explode the last time they saw them. They shouted out for their subordinates. Get far away from these vines. Too late. You should have ordered that the moment you heard me use this jutsu. It's truly far too late. Araki said while jumping high in the air and laughing out loud. Controlling the wind chakra around him allowed him to fly to some extent. He stared at the shinobi on the ground and also the three kages of the great villages. You destroyed Yuzushio since they posed a threat to you. Well then, congrats to all of you in turning that threat into reality. I, Senju Araki, declare the end of the IWA, Kiri and Kumo. Araki declared before raising a hand seal. Anoki saw Araki raising that hand seal and shouted with an anxious look, Run! He was in the air so he could be considered somewhat far away from the explosions. But, explode now. Thousands of wood dragons, encompassing a wide area, exploded at the same time. The explosion was so great that its strength approached the time when Araki had used Shin Susenju, true several thousand hands. The shinobi who were up against the jutsu had raised all sorts of walls, whether made of earth element or water. Nearly 90% of the shinobi had died in this jutsu. The ones who survived was because the captains near them immediately formed groups of 10 and made multiple layers of walls, a mixture of water wall and earth walls, to defend against the explosion before it reached them. These shinobis felt their innards shaking upon feeling the shockwaves. Although the third rakage had survived all these explosions, his son's luck wasn't as good as his father. He had lost his life in these chain of explosions. Upon seeing that his son and nearly all of the Kumo Shinobi had lost their life, the third Reikage's eyes reddened with anger. The anger he held towards Araki couldn't be explained in words. Araki was in the air, and he coldly smiled upon seeing the third Reikage's expression. What a great look you have right now, Reikage. I am honestly pleased that you didn't die in that explosion. My revenge would have remained incomplete. He then turned towards the third Mizukage who was fiercely glaring at Araki. This explosion had taken out six of the seven swordsmen of Kiri. Only one remained now. And that was also because this man was close to his own body. But even though they survived, the injuries weren't anything to scoff at. They could hardly stand let alone face Araki right now. Araki suddenly changed his direction and flew towards Anoki. Only Anoki was uninjured from this explosion and still retained a lot of his chakra. As Anoki saw Araki approaching him, the old man clenched his fists in anger and then raised his hands. Particle style. Atomic dismantling jutsu. This time, the cube Anoki had created was really large. It was his one of the most powerful attack. Araki was also within this area and found that he wouldn't be able to leave this cube. It was truly too massive. The white lightning shone and slowly blinded everyone's eyes. 
Even after using such a jutsu, Anoki didn't look relieved. He looked a little happy when he saw that Araki had vanished. Perhaps he had been annihilated into tiny pieces, but this still wasn't enough to make him happy. They had lost a lot in this battle. What's the matter, Suchikage? You look worried. My death didn't please you. Anoki heard a voice which scared him to death. He slowly raised his head and saw that Araki was flying very high in the sky. That was a wood clone. It was a good thing I substituted myself while I had the chance. It was a little dangerous, even for me, and I might have had to reveal you something, Araki said with a light-hearted tone. Anoki stared at Araki with wide-eyed looks before he immediately dropped down towards the ground. Araki stared at Anoki and let him reach Rakage's location. He didn't care much even though they had seemingly joined hands. Instead, he stared at the injured shinobi who had somehow survived the explosions. A callous smile appeared on Araki's lips as he said, Tell me something. What will you all do about a second one? Before they could understand what he meant, they saw Araki clapping his hands and speaking, Sage art with style. Deep forest emergence. This time, the jutsu was on a lower scale as compared to before. It was more concentrated, though. The trees were even closer to their location than before. The shinobi didn't have any chakra to even raise walls at this time. To them, putting up a fight against the thick vines was just impossible. Even the third Mizukage had a lot of injuries and exhausted a lot of his chakra earlier. He could hardly resist these vines before some of them finally pierced his leg. In just a couple of seconds, he felt as if he had aged ten or so years. He cut apart the vine before another two struck his leg. Next time, the third Mizukage was struck by three vines. And in two seconds, he became a dried corpse. The third Mizukage had finally died. The same was the case with shinobi around him. Nearly all of them had become tried shinobi now. And the vines were still flailing around. Araki asked the third Rakage and Anoki who had gone to cut apart the vines. Anoki was using the dust style to destroy all the vines he could. But his speed was far too slow and the rate of consumption of his chakra was far too rapid. The third rakage was having some trouble in cutting apart the vines. Even after he cut apart and disconnected them from the main branch, the vines continued to move. I am the one controlling them, rakage. Try harder, Araki said while slowly lowering down to the ground level. A tree rose from the ground at an unbelievable rate and Araki stopped on the peak of that tree while enjoying the show. Seeing the rakage, Tsuchikage trying so hard for nothing did bring a smile on his face. If the Tsuchikage and Rakage knew that Araki had only exhausted half of his chakra right now, they might just die of a heart attack. For some time, Araki continued to stare at Anoki, and the Rakage destroyed Vine one after another. He thought, this will take longer than I expected. He stared at the injured shinobi and concluded, I can consider them out of the war now. Their presence will do little to change the overall situation. He controlled the vines and launched all of them at the third Suchikage and the third Rakage. It was only a matter of time before the two fell to their deaths. Suchikage Sama, Rakage Sama, leave us, go and fight that fiend. Go and kill him, a shinobi said while pointing at Araki. We beg you, Suchikage Sama, Rakage Sama, don't let our deaths be for nothing. If nothing else, you must definitely kill him, another shinobi said while pointing at Araki. It seemed they were determined to sacrifice themselves if it meant Araki's death. Their hatred for Araki truly couldn't be measured. After thinking for some time, the third Suchikage said to the Rakage, Let's kill Senju Araki. These vines should disperse once we kill him. Although the third Suchikage had said this, his voice held traces of helplessness. He was quite aware that killing Araki was next to impossible. That was the whole reason he had initially suggested Rakage to first destroy the vines. Anoki needed time to think of a plan, and right now he did have one. But the thing was, he wasn't sure if it would work. If it did, it meant Araki's death only a small portion of their shinobi would survive. And if this plan failed, it meant everyone's death. However, at this point, no matter how small the possibility was, Anoki felt that he must try it. He looked at the rakage and said to him with a low voice, 
This tactic will need you to give it your whole strength. Use every bit of your speed that you can. Araki looked in interest as the rakage and the tsuchikage turned in his direction. It appeared that they had finally made their choice. Super lightened boulder jutsu. Instantly, the rakage's body felt as light as a feather. The two disappeared with a black flash and Araki was somewhat surprised to see them coming close to his body so soon. Thrust of Hell One Finger Mode Super Weighted Boulder Jutsu These two jutsus were used in conjunction. Araki opened his palm and waited for the Reikage's One Finger Mode to appear in his range. As soon as it did, he grabbed hold of that lightning-enhanced finger. He could feel his skin burning at an incredible rate, but he still didn't dare to delay and spoke. Super lightened boulder jutsu. Instantly, all the power behind Reikage's thrust of hell seemed to have vanished. But even if it was for an instant, Araki did feel a shockwave in his body. He didn't show it on the surface, though. On the surface, he had an indifferent look as he said, Did you think you were the only one who knew that jutsu? Suchikage? The two of you made the wrong choice. Before the two of them could do anything, a thick yet sharp vine was created from Araki's body and stabbed the third rakage's body. This was the first time someone had pierced the third rakage's body. It showed just how powerful and sharp this vine was. Well, another reason was that the super lightened boulder jutsu had also made the third rakage's defense weaker. Before Anoki could get away, the sharp vine pierced the third rakage's body completely and stabbed Anoki as well. Araki callously said, Now then, time for judgment. Karama had just finished his fight against the other tailed beasts. These Jinchurikis were trying their best to go past Karama and confront Araki. They had naturally seen his wide-range jutsus which pretty much annihilated all the three great shinobi armies. It was far too unreal. It was like they were looking at a tailed beast even stronger than the nine tails in the human form. Each one of them tried to go around Karama, but Karama was far too quick and strong for them. Moreover, he was in his release state while the others were Jinchurikis. Staying in the tailed beast mode placed an unreal amount of stress on their bodies. In terms of speed, other than the two-tailed Jinchuriki, none other could hold a candle to Karama. The seven-tailed beast was the only one capable of flight and was naturally flying towards Araki's position, however, before it could cross the halfway distance, it was bombarded with successive tailed beast bombs from Karama. Even the Jinchurikis were shocked as they felt an overwhelming disparity between themselves and Karama. Just how could the nine-tailed beast be so strong? Was it because he was released? a natural controller of nature chakra and knew how to use his chakra perfectly? Or was it just an unfair power granted to him since his birth? It appears that the war has come to an end. Karama turns his head towards the Iraqi's location. There, Karama saw land painted red. It was painted red with blood. To Iraqi's left, Karama noticed the corpse of a midget old man who was short even by human standards. Karama looked at Araki's right and saw some pieces of dark-colored flesh. Clearly, the human who had been cut apart into pieces was none other than the third rakage. Araki had a frown on his face as if he seemed unsatisfied. It didn't give me as much joy and satisfaction as I wanted. Whatever, I guess life doesn't exactly work according to my expectations. This was already good enough. Araki casually shrugged and started moving towards the only people surviving in this war. The seven-tailed beasts from the respective villages who had launched an attack at Kanoha. Soon enough, he appeared next to Karama and stared at the seven Jinchurkis in front of his eyes. As you can see, the war has ended. Do you still want to pointlessly struggle against me? You should all realize the difference between our power levels. Araki spoke with a serious look while staring at the seven Jinchuurki. It was none other than the four-tailed Jinchuurki, who answered, You think you can make us give up in such a manner? You have killed so many shinobi from our villages. This battle won't end until one side is utterly annihilated. That's right. I will definitely take revenge for my comrades you killed. I will kill you and take revenge for my brother and father. We... The five-tailed beast and eight-tailed beast Jinchurikis followed up after the four-tailed Jinchuriki. All the Jinchurikis were radiating fury while staring at Araki. Araki could feel it, it mirrored his own hatred when he wanted to kill the third Hokage or the Rakage. 
A cold smile appeared on his lips as he stared at their faces. Is that so? Do you think you are qualified to kill me? Come then. Even though Araki seemed a lot smaller than them in terms of size, the pressure he generated was immobilizing the massive bodies of the tailed beasts for a short interval. However, soon enough, they started moving. Kurama was about to rush forwards and intercept some of them. But Araki raised his arm and said, I will handle them alone. Araki continued to walk towards the tailed beast. He showed no signs of rushing towards them. The tailed beasts were in a rush. It appeared as if they were in a race to see who would hit Araki first. The first one in this line was surprisingly the eight-tailed beast. Considering its body, it was rather difficult for it to move around. And even more difficult to see it moving at such a pace. Even from afar, the hatred radiated by the eight-tailed Jinchuriki could be clearly felt. Sage art would style. Would dragon jutsu. Would dragons appeared from underneath the ground and started to coil around each of the seven-tailed Jinchuriki's bodies. They were surprised when they felt their bodies restrained by the wood chakra and also the fact that the wood dragon jutsu was absorbing their chakra and it was getting stronger. The two-tailed Jinchuriki was the first one to shout out. Let's go into the version 1 or version 2 mode. The tailed beast mode is being restrained by this strange wood chakra. Every other Jinchuriki soundlessly agreed. This was undoubtedly the best idea. Their large bodies contracted as the two-tailed Jinchuriki, three-tailed Jinchuriki, and four-tailed Jinchuriki went into version 1 mode, while the rest of the Jinchuriki went into the version 2 mode, just as they had changed their modes. Many Jinchurikis were surprised to find Araki missing from his position. A moment later, many Jinchurikis felt a sudden shockwave. They turned their eyes to the location from where this shockwave was generated. The other Jinchuriki were startled to see Araki and Killer Bee's fists making contact with each other. A second later, they saw Killer Bee flying away from his location. Araki looked at the other tailed beast and said with an indifferent look, Didn't you want to take me down? Come then. I don't have all day. Although they felt humiliated when they saw Araki talk to them like that, none of them dared to charge at this moment. They were angered but not utterly stupid. They knew well aware that this man entirely deserved to look down on all of them. If anything, he was more of a threat than QB. While they had fought against QB, they hadn't sensed much killing intent from QB. They guessed that QB only planned to hold them back for some time, or maybe he just wanted to fight for a longer period so he didn't kill any Jinchuriki. But Senju Araki was different from his gaze. They felt sharp yet boundless killing intent. They unconsciously gulped down a mouthful of saliva as they faintly sensed that they wouldn't survive this battle. However, now that they had sensed such a feeling, it made them want to fight even more violently. Since they wouldn't be surviving, there was no point in holding back any forbidden techniques. There was little to no possibility for them to survive this battle. But, they still wanted to bet on that slim chance and take their revenge. However, this slim chance turned to nothing when they started to fight a taijutsu battle against him. Even though they had seen Araki in his sage mode overpowering Killer B, some of them still thought of fighting against Araki in a taijutsu battle. The first one who had done so was none other than the four-tailed Jainchuriki. As Araki's punch landed on his chest, he used his other hand to grab hold of the four-tailed Jainchuriki and muttered something underneath his breath. A greenish glow appeared on the four-tailed Jinchuriki's body and surprisingly, the red-colored chakra cloak around him vanished. Araki didn't give him a chance to think this through and punched his head, crushing it then and there. After the death of the first Jinchuriki among them, the others soon followed. The Jinchuriki, who had lasted the longest among them, was none other than Killer Bee. Perhaps it was because of his talent in controlling the tailed beast chakra, or his endurance was just that good. But, even Killer B couldn't do anything against the relentless attacks from Araki. After having killed all the Jinchurikis, Araki released a seal on his body and recovered all his chakra. He immediately started the process of condensing the bodies of the tailed beasts whose Jinchurikis had died at his hands. Kurama soon joined by his side as he saw what Araki was doing. In nearly half an hour or so, the seven-tailed beasts slowly took shape. Most, if not all of them didn't appear to be happy as they took shape. All the tailed beasts glared at Araki. 
Some of them had bonded quite well with their Jain Shurikis. Araki noticed their glares but didn't care much about it. He expected this reaction from the tailed beasts. What is the meaning of this? Why are you trying to help us take shape? Do you want to take us to Kanoha and seal us in another vessel? It was two-tailed Bijou who asked Araki with a hint of hostility in its eyes. An interesting proposal, but no. Araki mildly said as he stared at the two-tailed Bijou. Then what is it you want from us? In return for granting you eternal freedom, I want your chakra. Not too much, just a tail's worth of your chakra. Araki didn't conceal anything and told them straight away. The tailed beasts, excluding Karama, were immediately angered upon hearing his words. You think we will give you any chakra after what you did to our Jinchuriki? Although my relations with my Jinchuriki weren't that good, it wasn't that bad. I won't be giving you any of my power. The same can be said about me. How can we believe your promise of giving us freedom? You humanity are a bunch of liars. Other than seven tails, six tails, and the three tails, all the tailed beasts slowly gave their input. Halfway through, Araki had stopped listening to their words. He was more focused on the arrival of someone. And soon enough, it did arrive. The one-tailed beast, Shikaku, Araki's wood clone was leading Shikaku to this place. They had started running a day earlier, having anticipated when the war might end and finally arrived right now. Shikaku, you are here as well. What are you doing here? And what are you doing with his clone? The tailed beasts asked with some surprise and anxious looks on their faces. Meanwhile, Shikaku was shocked to see them all released. He couldn't feel the presence of any human nearby. And when he turned around, he saw red-colored land to his side. He nearly shuddered as he wondered just how much blood was spilt for this land to be painted red? What do you mean? Aren't you also released by him? Shikaku asked them while pointing at Araki. This somewhat confused the tailed beasts. They wondered just what did Senju Araki by giving them freedom. He killed your Jinchuriki too? The four-tailed beast, Son Goku, asked Shikaku. To this, Shikaku nodded his head and replied, Yes. He told me that if I follow his instructions, no one will be able to seal me again. The tailed beasts turned silent. This was exactly what they had been told by Araki a few moments earlier. Was this the truth? Could they really attain freedom? But still, some of them had bonded with their Jinchurikis. Should they really give power to this man who had killed them all? However, it was the six-tailed beast, Saiken speaks. Your strength is indeed very great, while you are living, you can indeed accomplish your promise. But a human's life is very small as compared to us. What will happen after your death? The same cycle would continue again. Karama was also curious about this question. He had heard Araki saying that nobody will be able to capture the tailed beasts. So, how was he going to accomplish this? What makes you think that I will die? Araki asked them a single question. It puzzled the tailed beasts as they wondered just why was he asking such an obvious question. Let me clarify, I can absorb life force from nature itself. Whether it is trees, insects, humans, animals, as long as someone can't kill me with power, I won't die. And tell me, who is capable of killing me in the world at this moment? Araki asked them once again. Already having witnessed his power, the tailed beasts remained silent. Let me give you another reason why I am asking for your chakra. His eyes changed, and Crimson Rinnegan appeared in his normally black eyes. Rinnegan! All the tailed beasts exclaimed at the same time. This was a little different from the Rinnegan of the Sage of Six Paths. But they could feel that massive strength from it. I need all of your chakra to awaken the Rinna Sharingan. Araki said to the tailed beasts, I am out of here. I definitely won't be giving my chakra to you, the two tails said and was about to leave this place. Araki raised his brow at those words and said, I am asking for your chakra, don't mistake it with request. If you don't give me on your own accord, I will take it from you. You! Some of the tailed beasts were really angry at those words. What's the difference between you and the other humans who have tried to use us for our power? Why should I think about your benefit? Are you my friends or related to my family somehow? 
I don't think so. Each one of you other than Karama supported your Jinchurikis when you were fighting against me. I should consider you half an accomplice of the shinobi villages who tried to attack Kanoha. Staying neutral to you is already a huge blessing for you. But it seems you really want me to take action, Araki said before he clenched his fists and looked ready to fight against the tailed beasts, excluding Karama. The tailed beasts, who had sided against him cowered at his words. He wasn't wrong, considering that they had supported their Jinchurikis in an attack against Kanoha, their relationship was awfully strained. And from what they had witnessed, not a single-tailed beast wanted to fight against him. At that moment, Karama spoke up, Araki, I will give you my chakra. At that moment, the three-tailed beast, Isabu also spoke, Take my chakra as well. It's just a tailed worth of chakra, right? But you must make sure that I never get captured again. Araki nodded his head in turn and stared at the other tailed beasts who were still glaring at him. So then, what will it be? Make your choice. He spoke with a massive pressure leaking from his body. All right, I will give you my chakra. Make sure that no one will take away my freedom again. Same for me. Just like that, all the tailed beasts slowly agreed. They all turned their bodies and one tailed from each one of the tailed beasts touched Araki's body and the transfer of chakra started. At this moment, Araki was within his mindscape. There, he saw the chakra of all the nine bijus combining at an incredible rate and transforming into the ten tails chakra. At that moment, he felt an otherworldly power controlling a bit of his chakra and combining it with a bit of ten tails chakra. Araki wasn't startled. He knew what was happening and spoke with an emotionless voice. So, you have finally appeared. Sure enough, an old man with Rinnegan in his eyes and Rinnesharingan open as his third eye which was situated in the middle of his forehead appeared. He held a black staff and stared at Araki with an impassive look on his face. It was unknown what he was thinking. He spoke with an elderly voice. Your words suggest that you knew about me. Ever since I absorbed Kagaya's memories, I got the feeling that someone was observing me from someplace. I guess it was most probably you since if you have inherited the Atsutsuki blood from Kagaya and mastered the Rinnesharingan, you should have become an existence above life and death. It appeared that I was right, Sage of the Six Paths. Or should I say, Atsutsuki Hagoromo. Araki's voice spat out the name of the Sage of the Six Paths. You absorbed my mother? Hagoromo didn't conceal his surprise while staring at Araki, and then slowly nodded. I see. That explains your Rinnegan. Now then, speak what you have to say. I am a little busy here. Araki casually said to Hagoromo. The Sage of the Six Paths remained quiet for some period before he spoke. I have come to warn you, you are intervening with the destiny of the world far too much. I had been told that there would appear a day when all the tailed beasts would place their trust in a human. It was the Sage of the Toads from Mount Mayaboku. If I remember correctly, his name was Gamamaru. Araki remained quiet about words of the Sage of the Six Paths. He didn't understand how this toad was somehow related to all this. Still, he decided to give him the benefit of the doubt and stayed quiet. Gamamaru saw a vision far into the future where the tailed beasts would unite with a blue-eyed person, and with their assistance, he would lead the world to peace. The Sage of Six Paths paused, expecting some sort of comment from Araki. Araki shrugged a little and didn't care much about this prophecy. So, how are the hallucinations of an old toad related to me? As for peace, that was a good one. Hagoromo frowned upon hearing him say that and continued. Your interference has already altered the course of destiny, can no longer return to its original course, and what you are about to do will destroy the balance that had existed for so long. Ho! Oh, so, you know about my plan? Araki stared at Hagoromo with a look of interest present in his eyes. The chakra you have gathered from all the tailed beasts, you are planning on using it together with your own chakra and forcefully fuse the ghetto statue with your body. You want to ascend and become a god, a similar existence as my mother or myself. Hagoromo said with a hint of seriousness present in his eyes. Hmm, you are more or less right about that, Hagoromo. I will indeed be ascending to the level of god. 
Araki affirmed the thoughts of the Sage of the Six Paths. This affirmation didn't seem to please the Sage of the Six Paths. However, I have no idea what you plan to do after you ascend and become a god. The power you hold will be far too great. Any sort of action from you will cause a great chain of consequences. Hagoromo said with a grave tone. Yes, I am aware of that. Your actions will decide whether the world would have peace, or it will fall into chaos again. What I want to know is your answer. Why are you acquiring such power? Hagoromo asked Araki very seriously. Upon facing the serious look on Hagoromo's face, Araki let out a sigh. This was going just the way he had anticipated. Let me ask you something, Atsutsuki Hagoromo. Why is it necessary that I do something to create a peaceful or chaotic world? Why is it necessary that I take action with such thinking? Araki asked Hagoromo with a serious look in his eyes. What do you mean, why? Don't you wish for all strife to end? You will have the power to do so dash before Hagoromo could speak any further. Araki cut him off. Tell me, is a rich man obligated to share his wealth with a poorer person? Araki didn't expect an answer from Hagoromo. And sure enough, Hagoromo didn't reply anything to him. No, he isn't obligated. Why so? Because he has worked for his wealth. If the wealth is hereditary, then that means his ancestors worked for this wealth. Now then, tell me, why should I use my power to think of this shitty world? Araki raised his voice as he asked Hagoromo. Peace? It's a beautiful notion. Something that looks well on papers and melodious upon hearing. But are you aware of the sad reality? Humans, including me, cannot live in peace. They will always seek chaos like a mad animal. What happened to the peace that my grandfather created between the five great villages? It was shattered without a second thought. Araki seemed to be on the rant as he continued. Let's take my current possibilities. I can make all the villages stop fighting and make them sign an agreement. Will that end it all and bring peace? Perhaps until I am near my death, it will. But after that, I don't need to say about the results, right? And as for using force, that's even more foolish. Hagoromo looked at Araki and said with a frown on his face, You have far too little faith in humanity. Do you truly believe that they are incapable of coexisting in peace? Yes, I honestly believe so. And why are you asking me when you are already aware of it? Araki said with a hint of disgust in his voice. After having sealed my mother, I have spread Ninshu all over the world to allow them to connect to each other on another level. Hagoromo informed Araki rather calmly. And yet we had clan wars until my grandfather's generations. Well, you can excuse yourself by saying that the battles between the Senju and Uchiha clan were because of the Black Zetsu's interference. But what of the other clans that have been formed? Aren't they also the descendants of your disciples who were spreading Ninshu? What is your excuse now? Araki asked, a little angry while staring at Hagoromo's face. Speechless, aren't you? I am also quite speechless. From Kagaya's memories, I know that the humans of that era were also just as greedy, just as foolish, and just as people who wanted conflict. The humans had no chakra, so they were fighting with sword, axe, bows, or some other weapon. But what did the great sage of the six paths do? He spread power to them all, trying to connect them. A scowl appeared on Araki's face as he sarcastically spoke the words great and connect. Were you trying to tell them that fighting with sword and bow was old-fashioned and they should throw jutsus at each other from now? Spreading chakra would lead to world peace. You know what? I can't even laugh at such a bad joke. Araki shouted at the Sage of the Six Paths, Is that so? But as I recall, no fighting occurred during my time. I believe you are far too radical in your beliefs, Senju Araki. The Sage of the Six Paths commented while staring at Araki. Not in your generation, then what about the next? Is this your idea of peace? That it should occur for a generation or two? And once again, the world should fall into the same state of warfare. You made a horrible error in spreading Nin Shu believing that humanity would use it to connect with each other. No matter what era, humans will always have the seven deadly sins within them. As long as those sins are not removed from humans, they will always seek conflict. At this moment, 
Hagoromo's eyes dropped as he said, However, that being will no longer be called human. I see what you mean. Araki continued speaking. I do not want this power because of something as insignificant as peace or chaos. I simply wanted to protect myself and my descendants from the threats out there. Threats? What do you mean by threats? Hagoromo was quite confused by Araki's words. You and your brother, you both are truly so foolish that I don't know what to say. Araki let out a sigh as he said that. Hagoromo didn't care about these words. He was more curious about this threat that Araki spoke. Just who was worthy enough to be called a threat by Araki at his current level of power? And why did Araki want to ascend to a god to deal with these threats? At the very least, Hagoromo wasn't aware of anyone like that. Noticing the confusion on Hagoromo's face, Araki decided to clarify. You and your brother sealed your mother. I don't really care about that. I know from her memories that it all started with humans' lust and greed, then Kagaya's actions in response to that human malice, and its consequences before she ultimately felt betrayed and went bats hit crazy due to the influence of the divine tree Shinju. But, there was something you overlooked. Did a question never appear in your mind about why Kagaya was creating an army of white Zetsus? Araki asked Hagoromo quite seriously. For the first time since their conversation started, Hagoromo's eyes widened. Indeed, this was something they completely overlooked. He and his brother, Hamura, knew that their mother was doing wicked things and must be put down for good. But the reason still eluded the two of them. The two took precautions in case of her revival as Hamura took the ghetto statue to the moon. Unless someone awakened Rinnegan, it was virtually impossible to get the ghetto statue. And the sage of the six paths spread his teachings to all the world in an attempt to create peace. It's quite ironic how the two of you both failed in your objectives. Anyway, you aren't aware of it, but Kagaya was a member of the Celestial Atsutsuki clan. From what I understand, it's quite far away from this place. The only way to travel is by hopping through dimensions. She came in this world to acquire the power of the Divine Tree Shinju and fight against her clan members. She wanted to have all your chakra because she was aware that even her strength was not enough to put up a fight against the members of the Atsutsuki clan. This was her true motive behind coming to this place and fusing with the Divine Tree Shinju. Araki explained this to the Sage of Six Paths quite patiently. This, I had little to no idea of this. Hagoromo was truly very surprised. Hmm. Araki grunted in response while turning at the black sphere which had formed after the combination of the one-tailed worth of chakra from each of the nine bijus, excluding Shikaku, he gave only half a tailed worth of his chakra. Will this much chakra be enough for you to awaken the Rinnisharingan or all its abilities? Hagoromo asked Araki, but his face told Araki that he already knew the answer. But still, Araki decided to answer him, well, I am certainly hopeful about it but I know that it's impossible to go it this way. The chakra from the tailed beasts is far too less. But since my body would fuse with this chakra, my body would start creating it by using the nature chakra. It would take years to completely awaken all the abilities. He remained quite indifferent as this time gap wasn't much to him. Considering that he wasn't going to age, he had plenty of time to become stronger. Is that so? The sage of the six paths slowly said. He then started talking. All these years, I have been saving a lot of chakra from the reincarnation of Azura and Indra to give them this chakra in case my mother was unsealed, but you have already dealt with that. And it appears that a greater threat is on loose. A determined look appeared in his eyes as he said, Senju Araki, can you tell me one last thing? What will you do after becoming God? You have stated that you won't work for peace or chaos, meaning you will slowly stop interacting with the humans altogether. Then what else do you plan to do? Well, I would lead all the people in the Senju clan to Yuzushio and spend time with my family first. Until I have seen my grandchild grow up, I guess. After that, I will take Kushina and start exploring other dimensions and remove any trace from that location so that any Atsutsuki clan member wouldn't come to the elemental nations. Araki said quite offhandedly, I see. That's good enough. The Sage of the Six Paths turned around and stared at the black sphere that was forming after the combination of Nine-Tailed Beast's Chakra. 
A faint trace of chakra started to move towards this black sphere and combine with it. Araki raised his brow as he asked the Sage of the Six Paths, Are you sure about this? You can only maintain this spiritual body because of your tremendous chakra. If you give it to me, you will disappear from good. It's also not as helpful to me as you might believe. From Kagaya's memories, I estimate that I would only need 10 to 15 years to awaken all the abilities of Rinnasharingan and another 5 years to master them. I don't believe the Atsutsuki clan would find this place before that, Araki said with a serious voice. However, the Sage of Six Paths didn't stop. She replied, You may be right about that, but you must remember that you cannot be careless against the Atsutsuki clan. It was my and my brother's fault that we never considered the attack from the Atsutsuki clan. This can be considered as my atonement. Don't stop me. I will only be giving you half my chakra. Since I was the previous host of Jubi and my chakra absorbed its certain properties, I am sure half of my chakra will be enough to awaken all the abilities of your Rinnasharingan and make your chakra even stronger. The rest of my chakra would be enough to maintain my existence and perhaps grant my power to someone in the future if you fall. Hagoromo said to Araki while sending his chakra to the black sphere. Not putting all your eggs in a single basket. Huh. Araki said with a shrug, he didn't care much about the thoughts of the Sage of the Six Paths. To him, it was just an unexpected boon, but even without it, it would have worked just fine. His plans would have been delayed by 10 or 20 years though. Soon enough, the Sage of the Six Paths disappeared after having given half of his chakra to Araki. The chakra combined with the black sphere. Araki then stared at the Jubi's husk within his mindscape, which wasn't responding at all. Firstly, he sent a weak stream of chakra into the mouth of the ghetto statue. The ghetto statue seemed to have been activated. It was about to stand up before Araki used the black sphere and his own chakra to suddenly crush the ghetto statue with it. The ghetto statue seemingly shattered upon an impact from the combined blow. But even after it was shattered into many pieces, it still continued to exist. Araki was already aware that destroying the ghetto statue completely was utterly impossible. It was a work of nature. Instead, he slowly extended the black sphere, his own chakra, and the shattered parts of the Jubi's husk. These three components started to fuse with each other. The process of the fusion was unexpectedly quick. Araki felt that it was most probably because of the mixture of the Sage of the Six Paths Chakra. Since that chakra contained a trace of the Tentails Chakra, the Tentails didn't put up any resistance while fusing with it. In the real world, Araki's black hair changed to white color, his skin became paler, and a white cloak covered his body. Ten black spheres compressed of pure powers also appeared around his body. These were truth-seeking orb. The tailed beasts were startled upon seeing this chakra. They didn't think Araki would become the same existence as the Sage of the Six Paths. Even Karama had no idea that Araki had sealed the Jubi's husk within his own body and the fact that he had absorbed Kagaya's memories. Araki slowly opened his eyes and looked at the tailed beasts. His crimson rinnegan was different from before. Three black tomos were lined within each ripple of his rinnegan. So, this is what it feels like after becoming a god, Araki said with a hint of amusement in his voice. He added, It's pretty bland, I guess. The tailed beasts were utterly silent upon seeing Araki's new appearance. Karama muttered with a low voice, Old man. He was remembering his creator and seeing his image while staring at Araki. It was unknown whether Araki heard his words or not. But if he did hear them, he didn't comment on it. Instead, Araki stared at his own body, slightly disappointed at the transformation. He certainly didn't like this appearance. But he didn't say anything about it. He instead turned towards the tailed beasts. All right now, I will give you two choices. Do you want to stay in this realm, coexisting with humans, but retaining your freedom? Or do you want to stay in another dimension? There might be some beasts in that dimension, but nothing much compared to you tailed beasts, so you wouldn't be threatened at all. If you choose the first option, I will seal some of my chakra into you, and if you are in any trouble, just send a pulse through it. My clone would appear, and it should be sufficient to deal with any threats. By some chance it isn't sufficient, I will be notified of the threat and personally come to resolve it. 
you can consider it a benefit for voluntarily giving me your chakra. As for the second option, I think I already told a bit about it. Oh, and I will create a link between me and you all. If you want to return, tell me about it, and I will open a portal for you to return. A grin appeared on his face as he cheekily added, Well, try not to talk too much to me, though. I might start ignoring you. The tailed beasts didn't care much about this fact. The first one to speak was Shikaku. All right then, send me to a dimension with a lot of sand. If there isn't a dimension like that, I might just stay in the land of wind. Araki touched his chin and muttered, Hmm, there should be a world like that, right? He raises his head and looks in the sky. He concentrated some chakra in his left-eyed Rinisharingan, and a spatial rift could be seen in the air. The spatial rift slowly opened, and suddenly, lava started pouring out from the portal. However, before it reached Araki's face, it seemed to have vanished. The tailed beasts were shocked though. They sensed the utilization of water in the moisture which rapidly lowered the temperature and the wind chakra which cut it apart into smithereens before taking away the residual somewhere else. It was so fast that if not for their supernatural senses, they would have failed to detect it. Moreover, it was astounding as they didn't even see a rocky move. Each one shuddered as they thought in their heads. Just how strong has he become? Looks like this is a magma world. Anyone want to hop in? Araki asked the tailed beasts. Not a single tailed beast replied, and Araki shrugged in response. I guess that's to be expected. Internally, he thought that was surprising though, to think that opening a portal to another dimension would require such immense chakra. Hmm, on to the next world then. He closed the portal soon enough and then opened another world. It was an ice world. The icy wind from that location flew to Araki's world and would have frozen any normal human down to their bones. But no normal person was standing there. Nine were the tailed beasts while the only human there had already ascended to become a god. It would be strange if something could affect him at this point. Not a single tailed beast expressed their desire to go into this world. The next was a world with high gravity. Once again, no one expressed any willingness to go there. The portal opened in another world, and this time all of them saw a world with sea as far as eyes could see. The three-tailed beast, Isabu, said with a hint of laziness, I want to go to this world. Oh, okay. Araki was a little surprised when he heard Isabu talking about going to this world, and he slowly nodded. He closed the portal and opened a portal beside Isabu of a large size large enough for a tailed beast to pass through it. Araki stepped forward and touched Isabu's body, creating a mental link between the two of them. The three-tailed bijou slowly walked past the portal and fell into the boundless ocean. Araki then let out a sigh and closed the portal. All right then, on to the next world. The next was finally the desert world that Shikaku wanted to live in. Araki sensed the presence of some living beings in the dimension. Still, they didn't seem to have any power in them. So, he let Shikaku pass through the portal and enter this world. After this, Araki showed another three worlds to the tailed beasts. Still, no one else expressed their desire to go to another dimension. Araki didn't care much about it. He slowly stepped towards each tailed beast's body and sent some of his chakra in them. This chakra would remain unresponsible unless a specific wave of chakra was targeted at it. All the tailed beasts, barring Karama, dispersed themselves. Araki turned towards Karama and said to him, So then, what are you going to do from now? Karama hesitated a little before speaking. I will go with you to Yuzushio. I can protect them from external attacks, the attacks in which you don't need to involve yourself. Araki was surprised at those words and his pupils widened a little. He showed a grateful expression and said, Thanks, Karama. I won't forget this. He then turned towards the direction of the land of lightning and said, Wait for me here. I will cut off the loose ends now. Hmm? There is still something left for you to do. Karama looked surprised as he asked Araki. It was just a snake who slipped through my hands. After saying that, Araki vanished into thin air. With purple lightning around his body, he was flying towards the land of lightning at lightning quick speed. Before long, he reached the location of the hideout of his dear snake, Orochimaru. 
It was in a cave near the Kumo village. This was not just Orochimaru's hideout, but one of his precious laboratory. I don't have the patience to play with him. Ending this in one quick strike will be better. As he finished speaking, Araki raised his hand. Dark clouds gathered above the land of lightning. People weren't surprised at this phenomenon. They had seen lightning quite frequently. But if these people were to know that the entire land of lightning had been covered by the dark clouds, they would have been entirely frightened to the point their souls would be leaving their bodies. Because this had never occurred in the history of the land of lightning. Araki softly whispered, Annihilate it, heavenly lightning. The clouds roared as if having received their command. At that moment, purple lightning started to blink and concentrated on a single point. Upon Araki's signal, that single point released a massive and thick bolt of purple lightning, whose radius was wide enough to cover the entire village of Kumo. Orochimaru, who had been conducting his researching at this moment, was shocked when he saw a flash of purple color. And in the next moment, all his hideout and the area around it was utterly destroyed. Everything was annihilated in the range of the heavenly lightning. Hmm, I guess that takes care of the snake. Time to return now. Araki's words drifted in the wind as he returned to Kurama's location, and the two started walking to Yuzushio. Kurama and Araki were going towards the direction of Yuzushio. Before having come to the war here, Araki had already given the instruction to the entire Senju clan to relocate to Yuzushio. Tsunade was naturally shocked to hear that. She didn't have any idea that these were all Uzumaki clan members. But after they removed their seals and showed off their vibrant red hair, she started believing it. She also heard from them about how they survived from the attack of the three great villages using blood clones. At this moment, they were already inside Yuzushio. Kushina was waiting for Araki. She was entirely confident about his strength and knew that no one in the world could defeat him at this point. Araki also didn't want her to see the massacre he was about to commit, so he forced her to remain at home. While Araki and Kurama were on their way, Araki had finally changed his appearance and returned to the way he originally was. The cloak and the truth-seeking orbs were absorbed into his body, and it would be visible once he used this mode again. The Rinnegan disappeared as well, and his eyes returned to normal. Upon seeing his appearance return to normal, Araki nodded his head with a hint of satisfaction. This was good enough. Kurama sweat dropped upon seeing Araki trying so hard to return his appearance to how it was before. He really didn't understand humans. After returning to Yuzushio, Araki met up with Kushina first and then all the Uzumaki clan members. He informed them about how Kurama had volunteered to protect Yuzushio from external threats. He also gave them strict instructions to not just depend on Kurama. At the end of the day, Yuzushio was their own home. They were the ones who were obligated to protect it by putting their lives on the line. Only when it was an enemy that they had no chance of defeating should they ask Kurama to help them out. The Uzumaki clan members understood what he wanted to say and obeyed his instructions. They didn't even ask him why he wouldn't protect them. They understood that he wanted them to stand on their own feet. To truly become independent and solve their own problems. After having met up with the Uzumaki clan members, he spent the rest of his day with Kushina. They walked around the whole island while he informed her of the fact that he had fused with the Tentails now. Upon Kushina's request, he showed her his Six Paths mode. Kushina was surprised to see his Six Paths mode, but she thought it was really cool. Well, it was quite a contrast to how Araki was disappointed with his new appearance. He turned off the Six Paths mode before he said to her, All right, let's go to Kanoha. We need to take care of some loose ends there. All right? Let's go. Kushina agreed readily. There were indeed some things that they needed to take care of. Araki felt that it was better to inform Kashiro about this matter. After all, he was the acting Hokage and Minato Nagato, and the rest of the Akatsuki members were staying in Kanoha. Minato was working hard to become a Kage, while Nagato was preparing to leave for aim with Yahiko, Konan, and the rest of the Akatsuki members. It seemed that they believed they were ready to take care of any surprise attacks from Hanzo. Besides, the last time Hanzo had taken action against the Akatsuki members, Araki had given him a great trauma. He certainly wouldn't be taking any action against them anytime soon. 
After returning to Kanoha, Araki first went to the Senju clan manor which had 30 or so servants, and Minato had been left to take care of it. After talking with Minato for some time and hearing that he was still determined to become a Hokage, Araki had a smile on his face. He was somewhat happy that Minato's determination hadn't broken after all this time, even after he came to know that Araki had appointed Kashiro as the acting Hokage. As if making a decision, Araki started walking towards the Hokage's office along with Kushina. So what are you going to do now? Are you going to ask Kashiro to hand over the Hokage's seat to Minato? Kushina asked Araki, a little curiously. Heh, aren't you curious? Araki spoke with a smile on his face. Kushina nodded her head and replied, A little. He then added, Well, to answer your question, no, I won't ask Kashiro to hand over his seat to Minato. That would be utterly disrespectful to both of them. It would also mean I don't believe in Minato's capability to grab the Hokage's seat by his own merits or Kashiro's merit in leading Kanoha. To be both of them somewhat equal though I prefer Minato more since he is the Senju clan member. All I would do would be to make it fair for the two of them, Araki informed Kushina, and before they realized it, they had reached the building. Araki entered the Hokage's office through the window, taking Kushina along with him. On the Hokage's seat, Kashiro was seated while he was reading many documents. His life had gotten quite busy since acquiring this job. He saw Araki entering the office through the window and wasn't surprised to see him or Kushina. A smile appeared on his face as he said, I have been waiting for you. Araki raised his brow and said with an amused smile, It appeared that you were counting on my victory rather than my defeat. I already knew the result before you departed to fight against them. The question was, How long will you take? A day? Or longer? Kashiro said with a shrug. I think even Kushina wouldn't have such confidence in my ability. Ow. He winced a little as Kushina pinched his arm. Hey, I am not wrong. You were worried about me. Kushina's face reddened a bit more, and she used more strength to pinch him. No, I wasn't. She fiercely denied it, but the reddish glow on her face seemed to say anything story. Upon seeing their interactions, Kashiro chuckled and said, it's always refreshing to see your interactions. I feel like it's time I marry someone as well. That's great. Be sure to send me an invitation, Araki said to Kashiro with a smile. Yup, we will definitely come to your wedding. Databane. Kushina also agreed and stopped pinching Araki. All right, I guess we should talk about the serious matter now. So why did you come, Araki? Is it that you want to inform me that you are the head of the Uzumaki clan? and that you have already left Kanoha and will live in Yuzushio from now. Kashiro asked Araki with a knowing smile on his face. Araki blinked a few times before he let out a sigh. I won't ask how you know that. It's probably another ability of those eyes. Well, you aren't wrong about that, Kashiro said while chuckling at Araki's words. After some time, Araki said, I guess that was one thing I wanted to inform you, but there is another thing. I guess you probably know. But I still believe I should inform you, Minato is a member of the Senju clan. I am the one who personally asked him to join it. So, you can consider Minato to be a full-fledged member of the Senju clan. Kashiro remained quiet and let Araki continue ahead. Minato wants to become Hokage, so he will be living in Kanoha and manage the Senju clan manor while working towards his dream. I see, Kashiro muttered with a calm look on his face. There was not a hint of anger or any other emotion on his face. Just a relaxed look. You are a lot calmer than I expected you to be, Araki said while observing Kashiro's facial expression. Since you haven't told me to give away the Hokage seat, it means that you don't plan on giving your support to Minato just because he is a member of your clan, Kashiro explained calmly. To this, Araki nodded his head and replied, Yes, that is why from now, Minato will be talking with the other clan heads and request their support to become Hokage. If half of them or more than half agrees, you must fight against Minato and defeat him to retain your position as a Hokage. I see. That's interesting. But it gives me an edge over Minato. After all, I am pretty much a Hokage, and I have been the Uchiha clan head for much longer as well. 
As long as I don't make a blunder, he won't gather enough support. Kashiro informed Araki with a frown. He naturally didn't want to back away from this challenge. But he felt that the challenge was somewhat unfair for Minato. This was not how he wanted to win against Minato. To this, Araki shrugged. If Minato cannot gather enough support, then that means that Kanoha is doing good under your reign. I believe that's a good conclusion as well. I see, but I still feel it's unfair to Minato. I will inform him that he can fight me anytime he wants. If he defeats me a single time, I will give him the position of Hokage. Kashiro said with full confidence. Whatever you want, I am washing my hands off this matter now. Araki said as he placed his arm around Kushina and flew away from the Hokage's office. Just as Kashiro had informed Araki, he called out for Minato and informed him of their deal. Minato was somewhat surprised but agreed to the deal. He didn't challenge Kashiro. It wasn't that he wasn't confident in his ability. He was naturally confident in his power and ability, it was just that he felt that he should have the support of the clans. If he couldn't have the support of at least 30% of the clans in Kanoha, it means that his own ability was lacking against Kashiro. If that was so, it was better to let Kashiro administer Kanoha. Araki and Kushina returned to their house in Yuzushio. Hmm, I wonder what we should do now. Araki asked Kushina offhandedly. Have some kids first. Databane. Kushina chirped immediately, and before Araki could reply, his mouth was sealed by Kushina's lips. After their lips broke contact, Kushina's hands started to take off Araki's clothes. Araki was a bit embarrassed for some moments before he reacted with the same passion as Kushina. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.